to order and welcome everyone to this, the 20th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2017. Can I remind members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent? Um, if we can move first to agenda item one, consideration of continued petitions. The first item on our agenda today is consideration of petition 1603, which calls for greater scrutiny, guidance and consultation on armed forces visits to schools in Scotland. And for this item, can I welcome Edward Mountain, MSP, um, who joins us for this issue. We are happy to be hearing today from representatives of the armed forces in order to understand more about the work that they do in relation to visiting schools in Scotland. I would note for anyone viewing our proceedings this morning that the witnesses for the first panel will not appear on screen. This is to reflect the wishes of the Ministry of Defence in relation to the personal safety of officers. So can I welcome to the meeting Brigadier Paul Buttery, Head of Training, Education, Skills, Recruiting and Resettlement, the Ministry of Defence, Wing Commander Ian Garnett, Field Force Commander North, the Royal Air Force, Commander Billy Adams, Commanding Officer, Recruiting Field Force and Area Recruiting Officer, Scotland and Northern Ireland Royal Navy, and Major Deborah Scott, SO2 Recruiting and Engagement Coordination, Headquarters 51st Infantry Brigade and Army Headquarters Scotland. Can I welcome you today and can I ask our witnesses to make an opening statement and in total of around 15 minutes or so, after which members will have the opportunity to ask questions. And in doing so, I would note that if there are any questions which the witnesses are not in a position to answer, members will understand that. Uh, uh, Brigadier Buttery, if you would like to lead off. Uh, convener, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. And uh, firstly, thank you for accepting the Minister for Armed Forces uh, offer and thus providing us the opportunity to come here and uh, give you this presentation, which I hope will help with your consideration of the petition. As mentioned, my name is Paul Buttery and I'm head of the Training, Education, Skills, Recruiting and Resettlement branch of the Ministry of Defence. I work for Chief of Defence People and therefore I'm responsible on behalf of Chief of Defence People for the policy framework associated with training, education, skills, recruitment and resettlement. And it is within this policy framework that we set within the MOD uh, that the Single Services Act. With me, as you've heard, I've got Commander Billy Adams from the Royal Navy, Wing Commander Ian Garnett from the Royal Air Force and Major Deb Scott representing the Army. Our brief uh, will take a number of sections. Firstly, I'll provide you with an overview of the policy which covers the outreach activity of the Armed Forces. Then my colleagues will each explain their services approach uh, to their respective outreach activity, describing the type and volume of activity uh, as it relates to school visits. Then I'll expand the presentation to include some broader context and finally uh, we're at your disposal to answer questions uh, within our areas of, of, of uh, responsibility. So moving on to this, uh, the next section and really outreach activity which includes the visits of armed forces to schools and is the main topic of this brief is covered in our policy and published within Joint Service Publication 545. Each of the armed services have their own outreach teams, as represented uh, here. Uh, and the outreach teams bring the armed forces to the attention of the wider community through their outreach programmes of direct to public external events and community engagement. These fall into one or more of the following categories. Um, raising awareness, uh, recruiting events, support to education and community-based uh, engagement. Outreach teams only visit educational establishments following a specific invitation and they are not to actively recruit in schools and students cannot be signed up or otherwise make a commitment to become a recruit into the armed forces during the course of any such visit. The purposes of these visits agreed with the establishments beforehand can range from raising awareness of the armed forces and their place within a democratic society to practical sessions aligned with the national curriculums designed to enhance teamwork, communications and STEM. By STEM, I apologise for the abbreviation, science, technology, engineering and maths skills, as well as building interest in the services uh, and in some cases explaining the wide range of careers available. In accordance with defence legal advice, outreach activity within educational establishments is only conducted 
once a letter of agreement has been exchanged with the establishment and the unit, following a risk assessment of the environment and the activities to be undertaken, only with a member of the establishment staff present, and once a copy of, copy of the MOD's uh, insurance arrangements have been exchanged uh, with the establishment that's been visited. So I think from a policy perspective, the three key points that I would perhaps emphasise is that Armed Forces Outreach Teams only visit schools after a specific invitation. No pupil or student is ever signed up or otherwise makes a commitment to become a recruit during a school visit. And the visits uh, range in activities including career events, citizenship talks, raising awareness of the armed forces and their position within democratic society, educational support, including science and maths that support national, the national curriculums, and the team building and leadership event, events that I've already mentioned too. With your permission, I'd now like to move on to uh, hand over the discussion to um, my colleagues, uh, starting uh, with Billy on my right. Good morning, everybody. Um, as introduced, Commander Billy Adams. I'm the commanding officer for the Naval Service uh, recruiting and outreach teams. Uh, the teams in Scotland are located in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee, Brasyth, Aberdeen and Inverness. And our approach to uh, school visits is very much in line with the, with the Brigadier's brief, uh, that we do not target particular uh, schools um, and we will only visit uh, schools at the invitation of either the head teacher or the careers teacher. Um, covering specific areas uh, throughout the country, uh, the teams um, will offer secondary schools within the catchment area updated publications uh, related to career opportunities available in the Naval Service. Uh, the schools are requested to make this information available in public areas uh, such as libraries. Um, we will also offer head teachers and careers teachers um, a range of outreach activities which we may uh, be able to conduct in support of uh, the school. And the various activities offered are such as uh, practical team building and leadership uh, tasks, STEM related activities, uh, interview technique sessions, tabletop uh, problem solving exercises, and the promotion of health and well-being, which is achieved uh, through physical training sessions and uh, cookery demonstrations. In addition to this range of uh, curriculum supported activities, the teams also offer bespoke presentations which will inform students of the role of the Naval Service, uh, operations that members of the service uh, are involved in currently and have been involved in, um, and we will also uh, offer um, career uh, opportunities uh, information on those uh, subjects. Um, members of the teams will also attend uh, bespoke uh, school careers fairs and again that is an invitation only. Uh, unfortunately for us we have a, a limited uh, number of uh, number in our teams in uh, Scotland and we can't uh, facilitate every request that we receive but we endeavour uh, to fulfil as many as we can. Thank you very much. Uh, Wing Commander Ian Garnett, I'm the Field Force Commander North. I'm responsible for the delivery of processing and outreach activities from the East Midlands, North of England, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Uh, the RAF will only ever go into a school where we are invited by the head teacher or the careers master or some, some such personality. The RAF categorises schools according to previous application and intake history. Therefore, if a community has no record or history of RAF involvement, uh, applications to join us, we are less likely to go to that school. We will still write and contact the school ask, and offering the activities, which I'll come on to in a moment, that we offer. But if, this, but if the school doesn't want us to attend, we simply won't go there. The activities that we offer um, are fivefold. Presentations and careers fairs. Presentations raise, raise awareness of the career opportunities within the RAF, and we focus very firmly on apprenticeship opportunities that we offer. These can be delivered as an informal discussion or a formal presentation as requested by the school. RNS, per, uh, my personnel, also attend schools and organise careers fairs along with other employer organisations. Personal development training. 
primarily to develop teamwork, leadership and communication skills and allow students to assess their skills and qualities by undertaking alien tasks. This training can enhance their employability, raise self-confidence, improve communication skills and encourage teamwork. Interview skills workshops. Enhance the student job seeking skills by means of interview instruction. How to prepare for an interview. Delivery, post interview actions. Sessions include demonstrations and role playing and if requested can include mock interviews and constructive feedback to the students themselves. STEM activities. These we do to, uh, activities to help develop hard and soft skills, such as following instructions, developing a plan, teamwork, effective communication, conflict resolution, and peer neg negotiation. They also help understanding of STEM principles. As a subjunct to that, we sponsor a third party to, to carry out a STEM roadshow across the UK, and actually currently in Scotland at the moment. That tours schools across the UK, giving demonstrations of science, engineering, and cyber, in an interactive and exciting way so as to encourage students to take up science and engineering. Presenters wear RAF branded polo shirts but are not RAF personnel. A member of the RAF is present but only to answer specific RAF questions at the end, not to carry out any specific presentations or careers briefs. Finally, other activities that we do include Operation X uh, is an attractive learning experience that uses multimedia platforms in a humanitarian aid mission to engage students in literacy, teamwork, communications, health and well-being. My personnel also visit schools to discuss visits and career opportunities with the careers martyrs and careers guidance staff. Thank you. I, as introduced, Major Deb Scott, I'm SO2 Recruiting and Engagement based at the Brigade in Stirling. Um, as my title suggests, I'm double-hatted. I'm responsible for the oversight of Army Reserve recruiting in Scotland, but also I'm a fundamental part of the Brigade Engagement Team. The Army advertises the support it can offer through various channels to schools, including the Army website, emails direct to schools, but also through educational organisations such as Skills Development Scotland and Energy Skills Partnership. In addition, we are able to network at many of the um, educational events that we attend to inform sc schools about the activities that we do. Some of the schools already know about them, but some of the teachers are very much more interested to find out more. The Army does proactively contact schools to ensure that the information that is displayed in their careers information libraries is current, and this is usually done on an annual basis. Once schools become aware of the activities available, they are able to book through a central booking service for some activity, or indeed local connections with military units can be and are used. All recruiting group delivered activity is formally booked by schools through the headquarters of recruiting group in Uphaven. Other army units in Scotland only visit a school once it has been coordinated through the brigade, brigade headquarters in liaison with the recruiting group. This ensures that activity is deconflicted. We have issued clear direction to our army units in Scotland who may be contacted directly by schools to ensure they understand and follow the policy regarding engagement with schools. We have numerous relationships in existence with schools that have used our services throughout the years to support their activity. They often contact us following an initial engagement as they see the value in, value in what we are able to deliver to their pupils and therefore want it to be repeated. At no point do we physically visit a school uninvited. It is always through an invitation and we confirm our attendance is still appropriate with the school prior to the event if required. Indeed, reviewing whether our attendance is appropriate is an ongoing process. If a school requests our support in any form, we will try to support it if we can. We're not selective and do not look to include or exclude schools based on any set of criteria. We aim to support all schools, be they independent or state sector, or a special needs school, and regardless of postcode area. We have a range of activities which we can deliver and can be tailored to meet the needs of the school's request, subject to our resources being available. There are various types of activity that can be delivered by the Army, as you have heard by the other two services. Some activity is formal, with a set lesson plan to deliver, and have to be booked formally. The teams that deliver these activities are all Disclosure Scotland and PVG cleared in the appropriate ratios and selected by the Army to be part of the delivery team. Other activity is more formal and these activities are usually booked on an ad hoc basis, requests from schools. So in terms of the formalised activity that we do, BASE is the British Army Support to Education and it's a range of resources and activities to, to, to support and enhance 
the learning experience of pupils in year S4 and above. It includes workshops on citizenship and science, uh, where pupils can design a ration pack snack. There's a forensics lesson and a maths lesson too. They are activities based on what we do in the army. As you would expect, we use our areas of expertise to design and deliver lessons to support the curriculum. For example, the math lesson is based on planning a skiing expedition to Norway. Resilience team building and leadership activity, known internally as the introductory personal <coughs> development activity, are part of the base, but in addition, often local contacts um, contact us to provide them with uh, team tasks. The Army's core values and standards include courage, physical and moral, loyalty and respect for others, all of which can be encouraged in pupils through the team tasks that we deliver. The team building is often an activity that is requested time and time again as a repeat activity by the same schools. We also deliver mock interview skills, which obviously help people to prepare for the world of work. In terms of STEM, the Army is continuing to support Defence's contribution to Her Majesty's Government's STEM agenda. Race for the Line Season 3 will take place in 2017 and 2018, following two successful years already, where we run it in conjunction with ESP in Scotland, and this year it will be with the Learning Partnership. The Army, um, indeed all three services, will act as hubs for local high schools who have entered the competition aimed at 11 to 12 year olds, and will assist in running race events ahead of regional and national finals. In fact, the Army was instrumental in bringing the Bloodhound Rocket Car Challenge competition to Scotland, financing and organising the launch event at the Scottish Science Centre and the training of college staff to deliver the workshops. This led to the formation of college hubs and the Rocket Car Challenges and long-term improvement in the collaboration between uh, colleges and the local schools, we feel. We've been working closely and in direct partnership with ESP for the last two years. In doing so, we have delivered, for example, uh, Big Bang events and the science festivals. The Army has a STEM youth engagement team. They have individuals based throughout the UK and we have two personnel allocated to Scotland um, in order to support the Army, um, to support Defence's commitment to increasing the take-up of STEM careers across the board, not just within the military. Operation Reflect is an Army initiative commemorating the centenary of the First World War. Trained soldiers provide direct support to teacher-led delivery of First World War lessons. With 2018 marking the centennial anniversary and the end of Op Reflect, we obviously have a fundamental part to play in assisting schools in commemorating. In terms of attendance at careers fairs and careers presentations, uh, we inform pupils of Army careers opportunities through formalised internal school career fairs or externally organised fairs where a number of schools are invited to attend. Here we give advice on the bursaries and scholarships available and apprenticeships, whereby the Army is the largest employer of apprenticeships in the UK and also the various career streams on offer. The careers presentations are delivered to small groups or to full year groups on a, the, the Army as a careers option. A set presentation is delivered and this is tailored to Scotland. The school will determine the audience composition and size. The Army also offers a five-day work experience course, giving an insight to pupils who have indicated an interest in the Army as a career. It informs pupils of the various career opportunities available and the recruitment process and is aimed at year S4 and above. Regarding careers fairs, presentations and work experience, the policy is that anyone over 14 but under 16 can be given a brochure, but any further contact with the Army is subject to them to providing parental consent. Over 16s but under 18s can register an expression of interest at an event, but they must then attend a careers office or apply, apply online to progress their application, which is also, also subject to parental consent and process checks. In terms of the less formalised support that I've mentioned, uh, this includes examples such as gala days, uh, where we go and attend schools and we perhaps take in some of the personal kit and equipment that soldiers have, and this helps pupils understand the Army's purpose and increases awareness of us and our place in society. We also receive specific requests from schools to support their individual activity. And examples of this include providing help during the school's health week, where we took in the 10-man ration pack to show them how this would be used. We provided climbing walls and bouncy assault courses also. Another specific example would be Loudoun Academy, whereby the Police Community Support Officer contacted us to assist in developing some team building skills 
uh, for some troubled pupils that they had there. So we were working closely with the police in, in that instance. In the same vein, another is the Army's Support to Youth Advantage Outreach Programme, which is in support of the Violence Reduction Unit. And this is a re residential course which is aimed at teamwork and team building. And that concludes the brief on Army's activity with school. Convener, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if I may just finally uh, just say that uh, we've given the, uh, the Ministry of Defence has provided a great deal of evidence uh, in terms of where the visits have taken place. If I can just put some of that in context, if that's possible. Over the period of the 1st of April 2016 to 31st of March 17, the Army made 8,635 visits to schools across the UK. 8% uh, of those, or just under 8% of those, were to uh, schools in Scotland. Um, based on the work that my team did, uh, the Scottish population represents 8.2% of the UK's population. Uh, so we're arguably under-representing uh, our visits to Scotland uh, by, albeit a small fraction, but I hope you'll forgive us uh, for that. Um, so hopefully that just puts a little bit of context into the scale of the visits that the, the armed forces do across the whole of the UK and the proportion of those visits where they take place. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and I think we find that very helpful. And probably some of the questions we've, uh, we're going to ask you've already, you've already answered. One, the question that I was going to open up with was really just to confirm that you always have to be invited into school. But I suppose it was quite interesting how you let schools know that they can invite you in now. I think uh, Major Scott has indicated how um, the Army might do that. But I wonder, in terms of the, the, the um, Navy and the RAF, what process do you have of let, making people, making schools aware that you exist and this service is available? Yeah, from an RAF perspective, uh, we will contact the schools by letter in the first instance, uh, to, uh, as we do across the UK. Um, so then they, they will then come back and contact us. But a, an awful lot of it is repeat schools who like our products and what we offer. And then word spreads around the other schools and then they contact us as well. So a lot of it's word of mouth at careers fairs where other teachers will come and say, what do you do? They're here from other schools. But we will always write a letter annually to all the schools offering our services in case they change their minds or whatever. But that's the only time we'll do it. So word of mouth or by letter. The specific letter goes out every year to all schools across Scotland? Across Scotland and the UK. Okay. UK. And for the Navy? Yeah, it's uh, very much the same. We, um, we send a, an annual letter out uh, with updates on careers information and um, activities available. Um, and what we do is we, we, we learn from the, the previous year on what activities have been popular within uh, the certain schools or if we've got new activities that we would like uh, to offer. Um, the range is there, but, but generally it is uh, spread word of mouth or if we have been in contact with careers teachers at specific events um, and they learn of uh, what is available to them. Okay, thanks very much for that. If we can move on in, uh, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, good morning to the, the, the panel. Um, looking at the data we've, we've got, uh, and as you've touched uh, already on, uh, in your opening remarks, it seems that the the purposes of the visits uh, can be split into two broad types, uh, curriculum-related visits and careers-related visits. So can you um, tell the committee uh, whether these visit types are arranged separately or if the armed forces might work with schools to offer a, a package of activities which might be delivered um, on a number of different dates? Um, so could you um, expand on these processes and, and uh, the discussions that you have to the committee? Uh, if I could start off, and I'll ask the colleagues. Um, the, 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 as we said to start with, the the activities are um, schools are made aware of what the activities that are available, uh, and then the armed forces teams only go and visit the schools on the invitation from the head teacher, um, and then it's a case of trying to program the right visits in with the, uh, that the school wants in with the time frame of the resources that the armed forces have. Uh, so that it is accurate to say that some schools get visited more than once in a academic year for different sorts of events. Um, uh, but if you want to expand. Um, yeah, 
as we said before, it's very much on what the school wants. So they, they'll see, we have a leaflet that, go, that they can have that lists all the activities that we do. And it's normally them looking at what they've got in their timetable. And we find at certain times of year, more, uh, some activity is more popular than others. The, the personal development activity, you know, when you're coming up to exam periods and there's, there's a lot of revision time um, and the schools um, often request us to come in um, at sort of exam, period, exam times to come in for that. Um, and again, the other is just in relation to what, what the school wants. So if they're doing a particular focus on, on uh, you know, World War One in, in history, then they'll request the op reflect. Um, but if they're doing something that's, if they're requesting something that's not on our list of activity, then we, we look at whether we've got the resources uh, and capability to do it. And if we, if we have, then we would do. Okay. Um, do you have any figures on how many schools are visited twice a year or three times a year? Um, I, we do have the data, but I haven't got the actual statistics for you. I, I haven't calculated um, those numbers, but they are available. Okay, is it possible to share that with the committee? I think I th yeah, um, I'd have to check. I think when you've got the list of... Sorry. Hang on, Deb. Uh, so from the work that we did at Anna, uh, last week, the um, number of schools receiving three or more visits uh, from the Army team is 70. Uh, the number of schools visiting three or more visits from the Royal Navy is 14, and the number of schools visiting three or more visits from the RAF uh, is 12. Um, and the number of uh, visits that receive uh, the number of schools that receive visits from two services is 98, i.e., two different services, if that makes sense. And the number of schools receiving visits from all three services is 22. Uh, that's out of a total. Uh, of just over a, th a thousand school visits um, from across the three services. Okay. And that's okay. across Scotland? That's just Scotland, yeah. yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks, it's good to have these uh, on record. Okay. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, one of the biggest concerns that I have, and this I think lies actually behind this petition, is the potential targeting of schools in areas of higher economic deprivation. Um, I know these concerns are refuted, but the concerns do, do remain. And can I just um, cite some of the figures that we have, that 83% uh, of the visits were made to state schools, 50% made to independent schools, and all army visits were made only to state schools, with one school being visited 31 times in an area. Can, can you maybe explain? That seems extraordinary to me. Can you maybe explain what that is? Uh, could I ask you where the what time frame that those figures are pulled from, please? From 2010 to 2012. Okay. Um, the data that I've got um, that we've been re um, sharing with the committee um, is more recent than that, and our approach to uh, engagement activities has has matured and is is quite different now uh, from. Um, uh, basically from about 2014 we've had a, a far more uh, control if, you, if that's um, the right, right word in terms of how our engagement activity is monitored who actually um, engages and what messages um, what is uh, explained and delivered to the schools so I don't think that um, uh, well, I know now there is no um, targeting of, um, of schools based on gender, on social background, um, or on the relative level um, uh, within any surrounding area of, of deprivation or anything like that. There is, there is absolutely no targeting on those grounds. <coughs> but from but there was previously. Well, I, I'm afraid I can't comment on whether there, there was or not. Um, I genuinely don't know. It, it might be anecdotal, um, but I, I, I would be surprised if there was a deliberate policy to do that. that would, I would find that surprising. Certainly the current policy isn't that and hasn't been since two, about 2014. So how does that square with the Army only visiting state schools? Do, do you have a policy not to visit independent schools? Well, I don't believe that's accurate either, I'm afraid. There isn't a policy that's, that says... No, I'm asking a, if you think there is, but that's according to... No, I know there isn't. So well, there, so, I know so there isn't visit, a policy. you do visit independent schools? Yes. Right, OK, thank you. Um, can, I, can I just ask another question? 
Could also ask you, I'm quite concerned about you, the data we have says that you visit primary and nursery schools. Um, I'm confused as to why you would you would do that. Uh, the MOD says that uh, these, these visits are not career visits, and yet a number of career advisors have been visiting these schools. Can you comment on that, please? Uh, yeah, again, um, visits to any school, regardless of the age group that the school uh, deals with, will be at the only at the invitation uh, of the head teacher. Um, the specific details of those sorts of visits, um, Deb, can you... I haven't got them to hand because we're focusing on high schools. But in terms of nursery schools and primary schools, again, it's normally visits. Uh, careers advisors might be double-hatted. It might be a title that says careers advisor, but they're also part of the outreach team. So, that, like, for example, I am recruiting and engagement because a lot of, of where we go to, we don't want to uh, have too many people getting in touch with them. So it sits with one person to maintain um, control um, so the schools have only got one point of contact as well, so it's less confusing. Um, and we would go to, um, I, I, I myself have been into a primary school where I've shown you know, my respirator and my webbing, and that's the sort of thing we would do. It wouldn't be a careers-based visit, it would be a, what, what's the army about? Do the army, uh, sorry, do the Navy and the um, RAF go into <coughs> yeah, primary? Yeah, from, from an RAF perspective, um, my teams would never go anywhere near a primary or a junior school because I don't simply don't have the resources. What does happen, though, is parents of children in said school will get in touch or they'll have a what does mummy and daddy do day uh, or a careers day and they'll just ask daddy if he wants to bring his pilot's uniform in and tell stories of flying fast jets. So it's a parent generally, not one of my team, because frankly, I don't have the time to, to cover those schools. Um, but it'll be a generic, what does daddy and mummy do at work? Because uh, we have obviously female fast jet pilots. So it's what do they do at work? And can you come in and show them a uniform and that kind of level of stuff? So it's, it's a show and tell, not a formal or any kind of structured attempt to talk to children about careers or briefs or anything like that nature, not at all. Maybe. Um, a specific example that I could give you um, is we, we do not send any information careers or otherwise to um, to primary schools. But a member of my team uh, went to a primary school in uh, Resythe uh, last year at a request to give a presentation on a project that the school were doing on the Battle of Jutland. And it was preceding a battlefield tour that the school had organised. And, th and that is really the type of um, engagement that we would have at primary level. Thank you. Tiny one. Just one final question. I'm still confused as to why two schools were visited 32 times. Um, would that be by request from the schools? Uh, uh, according to absolutely, I can't think of a reason why it would that would be the case if it hadn't have been for the school. There, there's no way that a armed forces team would be. I can't imagine how an armed forces team would be entertained turning up to the school that many times if they hadn't been by invitation. Surely the head teacher would have invited them to leave or not bother turning up anymore. That's what I would do if they were becoming a nuisance. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Michelle Barton. Um, I'm required to declare an interest before before I ask you your question. Um, my husband was an army officer, two of my sons have served in the British Army, and I was an RAFERT officer. Um, looking at the data we have provided, it, it's clear that the armed forces and schools offer a, a, a delivery to a wide range of year groups. But can you explain a little bit about how you address age-appropriate content and what you do in terms of presenta presentations when you're looking at different year groups? Yeah. I can't on that. I'm not. I'm not the designer. We, it comes from um, from the Army Recruiting and Training Division that I presume have looked at their curriculum. So I'm not. I can't answer. Uh, from an from an RAF perspective, um, we ha the only thing we we will start g engaging with them generally from f from about 14 years old mm. onwards in terms of formal careers briefs and presentations and start doing the mock interviews and preparing them for life outside. The only thing we have a specific targeted group is our STEM roadshow, uh, which is uh, from the ages of about 11 to 13. It has no careers input whatsoever. It's more to encourage STEM because we are a highly technological service and we want to encourage more people to do STEM, to do engineering, to do technology, to do cyber. So that's the only 
pre predominantly targeted group. The rest is eligible personnel and eligible uh, children. Uh, but again, by and large, it's to give them the skill sets and we don't promote it. We just merely wear a uniform. We just have to wear a uniform when we're doing mock interviews. But the interview is a generic issue, so nothing specifically. Okay. Um, I've got to start by saying I'm disappointed there's no naval service <laughs> history in your family. Um, Not near the sea. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, we, we don't have any specific policy in how we would um, approach uh, varying age groups, but the general uh, rule of thumb is um, any, anybody uh, of uh, who's not uh, looking at leaving school and, 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 and heading towards a career, uh, we would generally, presentations would be based around information only. It would be information on the Naval Service, uh, operations that, that, that are being undertaken, what life is like uh, being in the service and where we are uh, specific. I, I do believe that the skills are very good though. They will invite you to give a specific presentation or activity depending on the year group and the age and the theme of, of what it is the school are trying to achieve. And, uh, and we collectively, as three services, who all work together uh, on, on many occasions, try and deliver exactly what it is that the school wishes us uh, to achieve. I Can I? Oh, sorry. Oh, no. I was going to say, I think it's perhaps worth m mentioning that, of course, in the headquarters where the products are developed, uh, civil service uh, psychologists are employed, professional educational staff are also employed. Um, so um, they will be involved in the formulation of, of material, but the exact process, I'm afraid, I, we, we haven't got the expertise um, here, here today to be able to answer that question for you. Can I also ask, um, obviously the cadet forces play quite a big part, particularly with some of the younger early teens, um, sort of 12 upwards. Um, can you just explain to the committee how you relate or work with the cadet forces? Because they have quite a bit of contact into schools as well um, and are in effect promoting and recruiting into cadet units. Um, and obviously the CC CCF is embedded in the independent school sector and it is active often daily because they're part of the school system. So would you just like to explain to the committee how that works in terms of, of uh, I suppose, advisory career and information around schools and children? Okay. Well, of course, the um, Cadets is a national youth organisation and therefore separate uh, from the armed forces as the distinct British armed forces um, in, in that sense. Um, it's a organisation that is a voluntary organisation with voluntary helpers um, and um, er, as I understand everything that the cadets do in, involves parental consent um, either to be a cadet for their children to be a cadet and for any, any of the activities that the cadets then undertake. The cadets do get supported by the armed forces um, but again in the same way with, um, with schools it is at the request of the cadets units whereby the armed forces then offer offer the support that um, that has been requested if that's the right way around um, so um, again none of us are actually working in the cadet space um, here there is a separate element of the um, of the ministry of defense that covers cadets and reserve forces uh, and it might be more appropriate that that question is, is dealt with by them perhaps can I ask one last thing about that? Um, because I, I did wonder when looking at some of the papers and data, particularly around the numbers of visits and that sort of thing, whether actually um, on the information request that would have included cadet visits, which would have a, a significant impact. Mm -hmm. I don't, if from, from an army perspective, I don't think it would because the, um, the units, that's, that's part of our normal business, a unit going in to support the cadets' training activity. Um, they are affiliated, uh, a unit is affiliated to a cadet, um, so, um, cadet organisation, so mm. it, they would be doing requests on a weekly basis and that's, that's normal business. Mm. I can give from a, from a careers presentations perspective, I know that um, the only time that we do brief the cadets is once a year at their annual camp mm. uh, and that's, we don't go in on a more frequent basis than that. Um, Brian Whittle. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, another significant concern is the way that the balance is addressed uh, in any presentation or visit between the opportunities that may be offered 
in the armed forces as an armed forces career and the risks that might be faced by individuals who join the armed forces. And I wonder if you could tell us how you think that balance is struck. Um, I watched the uh, careers video last night and uh, I thought it was very balanced. Um, now, that might be my subjective assessment um, of that, but I, I suspect that anything that is watched is, is sub due to a subjective interpretation. It showed a diverse uh, range of opportunities from uh, human resource to combat to uh, engineering, uh, logistics, and, and a range of other op opportunities that were there. There didn't seem to be, as far as I could tell, any um, shying away from the sorts of activities that individuals might be called to do um, within the armed forces. But equally, because it is a career opportunity, to, to highlight those diverse and broad opportunities that individuals have uh, within the armed forces. The presentations that are given uh, in those careers fairs um, are just, um, if you like, the, the first presentation that would be given. If somebody, an individual, then wanted to uh, pursue their application through the armed forces, uh, the, the process by which that individual would then go through, there are uh, various checks and balances um, along the way uh, whereby individuals are absolutely, specifically, um, uh, it's brought to their attention of, of the risks and some of the sorts of operations that they may be deployed upon. So I, I, my personal view uh, is that it is balanced um, and, is, um, uh, and is part of a journey as, and as a potential recruit, once they've expressed an interest in joining, um, it, it's made very clear to them what the potential role or what the roles of the armed forces, uh, what, 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 what we're here to do. If I could ask, uh, as, as a former air cadet, um, I was, uh, I'm interested, the, the question here for me is, is where, this doesn't seem to be asked at the moment, is where the, the armed forces are getting the majority of the recruits from. Um, and I wonder, uh, from your perspective, are you looking through the cadet system predominantly or uh, uh, through the, the, the school system uh, uh, you know, to, to, to recruit? Well, we don't recruit from schools or from the cadets. Uh, that's a, a, a categorically a part of our policy. Um, so, um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, you know, the, one of the in, written in JSP 545, recruiting activity does not take place in schools. Um, and likewise, uh, the same applies to cadets as well. It absolutely is not a recruiting ground uh, for, um, for the armed forces. In fact, actually, I think the statistics um, for the cadets in Scotland um, relative to the rest of the UK is, um, is that far fewer cadets from Scottish cadet units join the armed forces than they do from uh, other cadet units across the UK. I think it's not. I'm not suggesting that you're actively recruiting. I'm just wondering where you get the recruits from. Uh, well, okay. Well, um, I think the statistic is somewhere about 16% of army recruits have been a cadet in the in in the past. So therefore, by definition, 84% haven't. Um, so um, the cadets, um, those cadets that do choose to go on and join. Uh, the armed forces uh, are a minority in, in that percentage terms. Could I, could I just add that that's nationally? In terms of yeah. Scotland, um, it is only 10%, so actually it's a lot less than, than the rest of the UK, um, with Northern Ireland actually being the, the largest with 22%, so it's 10% of cadets will join the army from Scotland. I don't have any more specific breakdown of, of you know, which geographical areas um, people have been recruited from. Um, or what the backgrounds were before. For me, yeah, Kavina, so if there's 84% not coming from recruits, I think I'm interested to think where, where they come from then. If you, if you, if you, Sorry, if, I, if I, maybe I misled you. If there's only 16% are, are being, are, of, of the people who are recruited into the armed forces are coming through the cadet system, where are the eight, other 84% coming from? Are there any figures around, around that? Or, or is it, you know, is it, it's not a walking off the street? 
it's, where are they coming from? Well, I haven't got that exact breakdown, but most of them are through um, through the either applying online um, or they do literally walk into the at the armed forces careers offices and start their application process through that. So a good number. I haven't got. I'm sorry, I haven't got the exact breakdown figures, um, but a good number of. Uh, Armed Forces applicants now apply online and start their application through the online process. But if a good number equally apply by going into an Armed Forces Careers Office and actually having a, a discussion uh, with a, a Careers Officer in those offices. So, uh, um, yeah, I think that's the two. Yeah, we, we, for the RAF, you can only apply online. You can come in and talk to us, but you cannot apply there and then, so we can't cajole anybody into doing anything. Okay. They have to have that breathing space to go away, have a think about it, and apply online, which then goes through to a civilian company who will process the application in the first instance. So it's handled by a civilian company who processes it, and put it that you can only apply from our website. There's no other way of applying to the RF. Okay. And I think um, if, it, if I can just, I think part of your question there is what, who are the people who are coming through? through the door at the moment. And just to give you um, an example for, from the Naval Service, I think we, we do a new joiners uh, survey um, and 44%, I believe, of uh, new joiners into the Navy will have had a, a member, a family member who has previous service in one of the, uh, the armed forces. Um, and we have such a diverse range of, of people so we have um, we, we have two entry uh, systems, one for rating entry and one for officer lev level. Uh, we have graduates joining as ratings, and we have non-graduates joining as officers, um, because there is uh, such a, a wide range of opportunities and and specialisations, and and all up to the age for for us certainly the age cap at the moment, which is under review is for regular service up to the age of 37. Uh, but again, that is being reviewed at the moment um, with uh, the, uh, uh, hopefully, the, the age being being uh, increased slightly. And we do get some, uh, lots of uh, more, as we call them, senior recruits uh, through the door at the moment. Thank you. Uh, yeah. An interesting stat you may be interested in, actually, the average age of a, uh, an airman entrant at the moment, as it stands, is age 24. And the average age of a, an officer entrant is 28. That is coming down from what it was previously. So, our, if you like, our demographic uh, bell curve suggests that actually we're going towards the older end of the market rather than the younger end of the market. Um, and interestingly, 33% of our commissioned, uh, of, of our entrants into initial officer training at RF Cranwell uh, are from our ranks. So that's where we, we're getting them from. So at least a third of our officers come from within our own organisation. We, we breed them and grow them and develop them within the service. But the average age is, say, 24 for airmen and 28 for officers. So they're coming from jobs post-school and post-university, actually. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Angus? Yeah, thanks, Convener. Just following on from, from that uh, line of questioning from, from Brian Whittle, um, during your recruitment process, do you... Do, do you capture any information uh, about whether young people who join the armed forces have previously participated in any of the activities that you've you've previously run in the schools uh, or careers presentations? Um, do you have any stats on that? Not that I'm aware of. Um, we, we, we do it on new joiners, so anybody joining the service will, will um, uh, note where their interest was born. Um, and I haven't got the exact figures, but I, I do know that some of that will be through um, previous engagement with the service, whether it be at um, school, college, university, or indeed um, another event such as Armed Forces Day, um, uh, as an example there. OK, I, I would have thought it was an easy thing to do, just ask when, when the, whether they were encouraged through the, 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 the visits? We do, we do ask that question of where, when, when they apply, is where did you first become interested or what inspired you to join? Um, and it's, as, as Billy said, it's a whole variety of reasons. Um, the problem is, 
from a psychological point of view, because we've done the analysis of this, is that it, it, it takes three, ty three contacts before someone will actually look at a particular job for a particular career. So it may not have been the first time, it's just the catalyst, whether it's just walking past during a coffee break because they're bored in their job or whatever. So there's so many different reasons why people will come and it may just be saw the Armed Forces Day Parade, saw an advert, saw a jet flying over their head when they're on holiday. There is so many variations of this, it's actually def very difficult to pin down. It was our outreach programme, it was an advert on TV or radio or whatever medium that we've used. So it's a really difficult question to ask actually, or to answer rather. Okay. Okay, uh, Rona McKay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you about inclusivity. Um, as part of our consideration for the pet uh, petition, we asked the Scottish Youth Parliament for their views. Um, one comment was from an LGBT person who um, commented that he found uh, the presentation stereotypical uh, masculinity being portrayed, and he found that discomforting. Um, how can you ensure that the, the tone and content of your visits, whether it's curriculum-based, um, careers or or whatever, are inclusive and do appeal to a diverse population? Well, we absolutely do do that. So again, I would ask which, uh, over what time frame that particular presentation, that data came from. Again, since 2014, our um, presentations and our policies have been um, directed to make the armed forces more inclusive. In fact, with the LGBT community, uh, the armed forces are highly regarded by Stonewall as an inclusive um, uh, employer. Um, we're in their top 50 of employers. So I just understand that. I think there's a wider perception, and I'm wondering how you specifically um, try to dispel that. Well, all the material that is used uh, now, as I say, I watched the video, the presentation last night for my own satisfaction. Um, and um, again, my opinion is, is that, as, as I mentioned before, it portrays a, div a diverse workforce um, across a diverse range of employments. Um, so it avoids gender stereotyping. Um, it doesn't specifically mention uh, LGBT. Um, but in terms of uh, giving an impression of a diverse, inclusive workforce, my opinion is is that the material that is used and has been used uh, since 2014 is absolutely cognizant of wanting to portray the armed forces as a diverse and inclusive employer. Any other comments? I'd just say about the teams as well that we look to, to send the outreach teams. You know, we try to get a cross section of personnel from across the army, which includes females and it includes BAME. You know, it's it's all, it's not always possible because actually you're after the most suitable person to, to go out into the outreach teams. But we do look to, to, again to try and you know a female might want only to speak to a female, and we try to offer that um, where possible. So it, you know, it is something that we look to try and do. Uh, we we attend pretty much every. Um, uh, uh, LGBT event uh, and pride event across the UK. My, my team will always go in uniform. Uh, we have a number of LGBT, BAME, je uh, ladies. I've got a whole range of people because we want to reflect our community to the community that we're inclusive. Uh, so we go to great lengths to say, come and join, come and have a go. It's, for us, it's best athlete. You, you, pass, you pass the test, we'll take you. We, we, you know, we, we are an open organisation, and we go to great lengths to be an open organisation. So I think that may be an old perception, and certainly all the material that we use will be inclusive. The, and we're very careful on language That's to make sure we are encouraging inclusive. to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. I think it's, um, it's, it's it, One of the difficulties is, is showing that there's a person behind the the uniform and, and, and in every area of society and, and I would completely agree with with my colleagues there you know we, we are we are charged with with working hard um, to um, attend as many of these outreach um, and engagement opportunities particularly in the pride uh, and LGBT uh, areas which which hopefully we're achieving thank you Michelle Martin. Going on from that, um, can you can you tell us a little bit about how, or if you you seek feedback from um, both young people, parents, teachers, on the presentations and activities you actually do within schools? 
our, from our perspective, we any brief we have, we will invite mm -hmm. the, the parents in. So if we're briefing uh, youngsters, we will invite parents in at all mm -hmm. times and answer their questions. So regularly on a stand at an event or, or that I go to on a regular basis, mm -hmm. I, I, I will, the, the parents will come and have a chat with me and almost ask the question on behalf of their son or daughter. Uh, which mm -hmm. does get quite entertaining sometimes. But yeah, we will we will always try and include them. So we'll make sure they've got the material. We'll, we'll answer any questions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and say we'll in, uh, openly invite and positively invite parents to come and ask the questions because we want them to be confident of what their son and daughter decisions are. But do you, do you actually have any formal methodology for actually um, collating feedback on the people's feelings about the events or the, or the input, how it went? In order, I mean, you mentioned earlier that you continually review what you've done. So, what do you do to continue to review it and decide to make changes and actually look at it whether it's working? Reviewing our attendance that, and that it's appropriate, um, mm. based perhaps on the security situation at the time. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not intimately involved in, in the delivery, so I'd, I'd have to consult uh, my colleagues back to check whether or not we do mm. seek feedback. I mean, the from, from my point of view, if they request us back, then it's positive feedback because it's obviously been a success. And if, if, it, if they didn't, then, then we'd probably be reviewing what, what the activity is. Can I ask one? Yeah. Um, very quickly, then, there's a perception that when people join the armed forces, they're going out to fight. Um, obviously, a high percentage don't. They work behind the scenes in a myriad of apprenticeships. Do you have any data um, sort of to explain how many youngsters actually who, who join the armed forces actually are doing things like dental nursing or these kind of jobs? Um, I don't off the top of my head, but that would be very easy to get hold mm. of, the breakdown of um, trades and, um, um, and... I don't know if you guys have got any... Um, no. But, of course, the, the, the armed forces is a structured organisation um, and... Uh, hierarchical organisation, therefore, and the manpower limits are well known. Uh, each of the trade branches and trade groups have got a structure within them, so individuals can progress their career, uh, and uh, both in terms of a personal and a professional manner, um, as they progress through the various trade branches. And as I alluded to when I about when I was talking about the uh, the video that I watched last night, it. Um, it explains the diverse range of opportunities, whether it's from HR to logistic accountancy, um, through to medical, dental, uh, including combat um, roles as well. So it, it shows the whole, well, in fact, actually it doesn't show the whole range because the, the range is quite significant. I mean, if I take the opportunity, you know, the armed forces provide over 40 different apprenticeship programmes. Um, so it is generally a very diverse employment base that um, people can go into. Um, yes, uh, Brigadier, thank you and your team for coming up. If I can just also make a declaration, I was 12 years in the Army uh, with eight years on the volunteer reserve, and I have a son currently serving. Um, I, I think it's very interesting, and, and you've highlighted, Brigadier, the democratic need, uh, or the democratic society needs an armed service, not just active service. I mean, I, I did work in Cyprus with relief agencies and in Uganda with relief agencies. My son helped uh, at the Olympics, uh, helping the police, and I deployed to Heathrow uh, on various occasions to do security there. You've also said that the reasons is, is clear for your visits to school. It's at the request of the school and no recruiting takes place. Could, Brigadier, could you and your team maybe give us some indication of the costs of training somebody from the moment they join? Uh, the, the services to the moment they pass out. And, and perhaps that would maybe give the committee an indication of how it's important to get the right people, not just a number of people. Um, well, again, go, linking back to the previous question, if I, if I may, because of the, um, the range of careers that individuals can start with uh, or embark upon within the armed forces, uh, the, the cost of training uh, an individual varies, of course. So the answer is, if I, a rather slippery answer is it depends, uh, of course, because um, uh, the training a fast jet pilot 
uh, because of the infrastructure, because the equipment uh, because of, is, is expensive, uh, because, um, and training a, a, a doctor is, can, is relatively expensive, and, and engineers are expensive, uh, to tr relatively expensive. So uh, there is differences depending upon the trade um, that is required and the degree of specialisation uh, in the overall training in the overall, the overall training budget. Uh, thank you, convener, and, and, and I would never accuse a brigadier of being slippery. Uh, but but I, I would say that I probably I think we pro probably accept that the costs are considerable and varied, and therefore I just wondered uh, if if you if you would be able to agree with me saying that considering the high costs and the huge investment that the armed services put into each individual that they train that the quality of the individual in a professional service matters more than just the numbers, because I think that's the nub of this. This whole petition is not just about trying to get numbers through the door. It's getting the right people with the right training. And I wonder if you could uh, uh, allude uh, to I that. Would I would agree um, with you that uh, the getting the right individual with the right skills uh, is hugely important to us with the right potential, um, I would say, because... Um, because of the opportunities to develop both their technical qualifications, whether they're educational or professional, um, and also the individual's personal soft skills, whether it's teamwork, um, communication skills, leadership, uh, those valuable soft skills that they then return to society with. Getting the right individual with the right um, potential to be able to train those skills in is, is the, the uh, predominant factor that we seek. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Thank you very much. I mean, I'm the generation that remembers the adverts where um, it was all about skiing, um, and at the same time there was, you know, people were being deployed to some quite um, difficult circumstances. I suppose, in conclusion, really, the, to me, that the what drives the petition is the sense that poverty is the greatest recruiting sergeant to the armed forces and that people don't get told about the reality. Now, we've heard quite a lot of evidence that would maybe um, argue against it. I wonder what your response is to that, that very strongly held view that people end up in the armed forces because of the limited choices, and therefore the armed forces take advantage of that, and that we're not honest about what they might face. And in answering that, I wonder if you talked about pre-2014, was there something about that period where there was a, a reflection on how the armed forces were recruiting that meant it was a change in policy, or is this something that's developed over time? Well, I, I think that now we would say that um, our recruiting uh, process is honest and open and transparent. As I've already alluded to, the realities of joining the armed forces are made very clear to a potential applicant. Uh, once they've made an expression of interest, uh, they see subsequent, uh, they're shown subsequent presentations that do not hide uh, and do not shy away from um, what we are ultimately, uh, what we might ultimately be required to do on behalf of the nation. Um, so that is uh, not something that is um, tried to be glossed over or to be glamorised or understated in any way whatsoever. Uh, we're a professional armed force and therefore um, uh, the, the nation would rely upon us to, to do what is needed when it's needed. However, as you mentioned, there are still opportunities out there for individuals that are ongoing that include skiing and to um, and, and enjoy playing sport and to live a healthy lifestyle. Um, that's part of being in the armed forces. But ultimately, the sacrifice that individuals might have to make it, we don't shy away from telling individuals uh, that at all. The programme uh, that we are now using, if you like, uh, the approach, sorry, that we have with to, to our engagement, I think has just become more professional as we have, as the armed forces has evolved and we have now a more professional approach to uh, our engagement activities. Uh, as I say, since 2014, we have a, um, a, a methodology whereby we track the activity, we record the activity, we use geo, uh, geo mapping to help us with that process. Um, so as technology has evolved, we have embraced the technology to help us um, with that. So I think our approach has evolved to become a more professional, 
coordinated um, approach to better reflect the society in, uh, that we are uh, that we're trying to engage with. And my final point, um, I think both Navy and the Armed Force, um, the RAF, the suggestion was that the biggest determinant was what your family involvement with the forces would be. Is that true of the Army as well? I don't know that okay. figure myself. No. No, I, I don't have the figures, but no, as we re referred to before, alluded to, you know, it's, it's the quality of the individual. And, it, and if somebody, I, I've got no military, previous military uh, background, none of my family were, um, but, you know, if, if an individual wants to join, then an individual wants to join. I was meaning more what created the interest, rather than, you know, active sort of seeking people out, actually, for the Navy and the RAF. It yeah, was I haven't, I haven't got the stats for that, I couldn't, I couldn't be able to tell you. Okay, Michelle, you want to ask something very briefly? Yeah, yeah, Say all of us got to ski with the army, so it still does happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, is it correct to say, actually, at the moment, that the worst recruited regiment in the army is actually the Royal Regiment of Scotland? And prior to the amalgamation of the Scottish regiments, um, they were the best recruited regiments. So there is something about allegiance and, and the sort of pals um, regiments that used to actually encourage youngsters, and that could actually be a, one of the things that's impacted in the change uh, of recruitment within Scotland. Uh, I can't deny or confirm that mm. hypothesis. Uh, I don't have that particular detail mm. in terms of um, which regiment within the British Army is recruited to a greater or lesser extent mm. uh, than others. But I would agree with your hypothesis uh, about um, the, the, um, the, 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 um, uh, the community feeling and the, the, you know, the sense of belonging that individuals have when they join uh, a unit uh, that's part of what we do is the teamwork um, piece as we um, our, um, our organization uh, relies strongly on um, cohesive teams working together those soft skills that individuals develop within those teams bind the uh, the men and women together um, so that they can do what um, and whether that and that's part of why the skiing the sport, you know, not we call it adventurous training. It sounds glamorous. Just call it skiing because it's 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 not just skiing in in that sense. Um, um, so the adventurous element of uh, the opportunities, uh, the sporting opportunities, are all there designed to develop leadership, to develop team cohesion, to develop individual courage, um, and. Um, whatever mechanism enables that, if the regimental system or the um, you know supports that in in a way that people belong to the, the small teams that they join, and then they make friends for life. Um, so um, I suspect that there is a. Uh, I'm agreeing with your hypothesis, but I don't have the evidence to to say whether it's a fact or not. Thank you. Okay. Um, can I thank you for that? I think we've really come to. Um, a conclusion in terms of our questions and it's now a matter for us to decide what our next steps are in relation to the petition. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions as to what um, those next steps should be. Brian? Um, that's, I think that's a lot of compreh comprehension. Uh, every session there, I think it would be um, a good idea to allow the petitioner to reflect and maybe come back to us on their um, their feeling as to, as, as to the evidence yeah. that was given today. Yeah. Rona? Um, I would like to ask um, for a geographical breakdown from local authorities, actually local authorities, to name the schools that have been visited in their area so we can get a get better picture of where the visits are taking place. And I don't know if that would be done through COSLA or... I wish whether that is something that we're, we're able to do in relation to data. I, mean, I suppose that the question is, if the forces don't come in until they're invited, are there some schools that are more likely to invite than others? But we well, have I heard think the that evidence. Would be to know. We have heard the evidence that some, for example, for the RAF, it's like where there's an interest already, then people are more likely to, to be involved. And you know, we know that there are communities in Scotland that are connected to army or to any um, particular air force in a way that others aren't. But that would be useful information if we can get I it. I think that would be can interesting to know. Yeah. Okay. Angus? Yeah, can we not, just uh, following on from Rona's point, um, not just the, the number of schools that have been visited, but how many schools have been visited, um, or which schools were visited uh, two, three or four times? 
Although this is, I mean, I suppose what we're, we're the petition is about. Are, are we are we moving into an area where we're looking at the policy of schools mm, um, in relation to engagement with the armed forces and where there is an interest and it's been successful in terms of the curriculum? The logic of that, you can see why they would then be inviting them back in again. This would also be true yeah. of other groups or whether it's theatre groups or whatever it tends to be. If you get an interest, if you get somebody a contact, the school then goes back to them. Right? If we're going to um, if, we're, if we're going to look at the schools that have been uh, visited by the armed forces, it would be maybe pertinent to overlay that with uh, armed force communities. Yes. Yeah. 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 Michelle. Yeah. Convener. <laughs> Albeit that I have declared an interest in this um, and I have been actively involved um, in the past with going into schools, um, particularly with the cadet forces and um, in direct conjunction with careers advisors within the area. Um, I have to say I, I do not see the point in pursuing this position. Um, I have always found the, the engagement with schools to be extremely professional. It is not, it is not there to persuade youngsters to join the armed forces under, um, I suppose, being mispersuaded that it's something that it's not. Um, I've always found it to be very honest and balanced in, in the approach. Um, I know a lot of youngsters who've decided to go into the armed forces and it certainly hasn't been as a result of visits to schools. Um, and I think the reality is a lot of the work that is done in schools is very much about building confidence and it is about encouraging and improving um, children's engagement with their own abilities. Um, and I think, I think we're in danger here of going down routes that are not yeah. what think, this is really about. You know, I think what, what we want to establish, what people sense to be the case, is in fact the case in relation to the, the data and, and what the committee clerk is, is saying, is that we have got the data and we can analyse that in terms mm -hmm. of, of schools and so on, and to give confidence to petitioners that precisely you describe it is actually mm -hmm. what's happening in terms of people's... I mean, I think um, our colleagues who have come along today have sought to give that reassurance, and I think it would be useful mm -hmm. to get the petitioner's response to that. Yeah. So it's not to prejudge it, but it's to test the sense of what's happening against yeah. actually what the facts are, and I think today's session has been really useful in that regard. Might it be useful, therefore, for us to look further at this petition once we've had the response from the petitioners? If that's agreed. Um, in that case, can I thank our um, witnesses very much for their attendance today. I think that's been useful. It's been a longer session than we would normally have, but there has been a lot of interest in it from the petitioners. We also <coughs> wanted to afford you the opportunity to, to respond to the questions of the committee. So can I thank you very much, and I'll suspend till we change over for our next set of witnesses. Thank you.
I call the meeting back to order and we now move to agenda item two, consideration of a new petition. We have one new petition for consideration this morning, petition 1668 by Anne Glenny on improving literary standards in schools through research informed reading instruction. Two written submissions in support of the petition are included with our meeting papers from Dr Marilyn Grant and Dr Sarah McGowan. I welcome Anne Glenny to the meeting along with Dr McGowan, Senior Lecturer in Development Psychology from the University of Edinburgh and Gordon Askew, MBE, from the International Foundation for Effective Reading Instruction. Um, you have an opportunity to make a brief opening statement of up to five minutes, and after that, the committee will ask a few questions to help inform our consideration of the petition. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to present evidence to the committee. I would especially like to thank Gordon Askew and Dr Sarah McGowan for giving evidence alongside me today. We have chosen to share the five minutes for our opening statements. I'm concerned about Scotland's decline in literacy standards. Through no fault of their own, teachers in Scotland lack the necessary deep subject knowledge required to teach reading effectively. This assertion is not new. It was highlighted in the 2014 review of the Scottish Government Literacy Hub approach. Despite being supported by research and being recommended specifically in the Scottish Government's Literacy Action Plan from October 2010, synthetic phonics is not supported by current Curriculum for Excellence documentation, nor is it covered adequately in initial teacher education. Reading research has moved on, but Scotland has not. We are around 12 years behind other countries on this. We cannot afford to wait any longer. So this petition is about ensuring teachers and teacher training institutions have access to and use research-informed reading instruction to ensure that all children in Scotland can achieve their potential in reading. This is not about removing teacher autonomy and it's not about implementing a prescriptive approach to the teaching of reading. This is about empowering teachers by ensuring that all teachers have access to the most up-to-date research on children's reading instruction and then allowing them to make decisions about how best to apply this based on the specific students that they teach. Now, I believe that synthetic phonics has the potential to achieve the Scottish Government's vision of narrowing the poverty related to the attainment gap in reading. Children from disadvantaged backgrounds typically start school with weaker vocabularies than children from more affluent backgrounds. What my research has shown is that when children are taught by an eclectic approach to read, that is, are taught a variety of strategies to read new words, such as whole word recognition or use of context, then their language skills predict how well they learn to read. However, when children are taught by a synthetic phonics approach, vocabulary skills do not predict word reading success. If you are committed to narrowing the poverty rate of the attainment gap in reading, surely it makes sense to educate teachers in a method of instruction which is not dependent on good vocabulary for success. Finally, I know of no research evidence to suggest that synthetic phonics undermines a love of reading. I believe that we are all passionate about ensuring that young children have a joy and interest in books, words and stories from a young age. What we know is that synthetic phonics needs to be positioned within a curriculum which develops broader oral language skills and a love of reading too. Synthetic phonics allows children to become independent readers earlier on, and we know that more skilled readers and independent readers go on to have more positive attitudes towards reading and are more confident and motivated readers. Good morning. Um, it's good to be with you. Uh, although I am the advisor to the DfE in England, I assure you I am not here because I think you ought to do what England does. I'm here as an individual to share my experience of what I know uh, works with children reading the English language wherever they, they live. One of the really remarkable things about reading over the past 50 or 60 years is that a lot of children learn to read and pick up reading almost however they are taught. However, and it is a very big however, there have always been a very significant number of children who do not pick up reading. Since we've had decent information, that has varied from 20% up to about 40%, but it has never really dropped below about 20%, regardless of however much attention has been given to reading. Very, very importantly, that 20% always includes some of the most disadvantaged uh, children in our society. This applies at the moment to a lot of schools in England. I know from my international work it applies to a lot of English-speaking countries right across the world. And yet, 
we now have a very, very significant number of, of schools teaching synthetic phonics alongside comprehension, where year on year, very high numbers of children, almost all children, high 90% are turning out as effective readers. These are not leafy suburb schools. In fact, quite the reverse in most cases. They cover a whole range of schools, in school, including a lot of schools in disadvantaged, challenging areas. Those schools, those 20%, which have for so long been failed by the system, are now learning to read alongside uh, all the other children. This is not theory. It's not what I believe. It's what I know. I have been to a lot of these schools myself, and if you didn't believe me, I could take you along to look for yourself. These schools don't follow a single prescription. They don't all use the same program, or, or they don't all use the same materials or books, but they do share an understanding that children read most effectively by decoding unknown words rather than guessing at them. And when I say reading effectively, these children read with full comprehension and are developing real enthusiasm for books. It's a totally unmerited slur to say that these schools' teaching of reading is arid and mechanistic. They teach comprehension and vocabulary just as strongly as they do phonics. They have teachers who really share enthusiasm and love for wonderful books uh, and reading. You could, by making sure that teachers have access to the right sort of information and training, be encouraging and supporting a system that would ensure that almost all children in Scotland learn to read, regardless of their background. Okay, thank you very much for that. That's a, a helpful introduction. Can I maybe open up by saying, um, in your petition, you indicate you've written to the Scottish Government, Education Scotland, Times Education, Supplement Scotland, and the General Teaching Council for Scotland. Can I ask whether you've received any responses um, from any of these organisations, and if so, what sort of feedback you received? Um, yes, I have received responses. Um, I can give you a, a flavour of them here. Um, generally, it's been to sort of say thank you very much, but but no thank you. We won't be pursuing it any further. Um, I have a lot of papers here. Um, this is from Jeff Maguire, Senior Policy Officer. Our understanding is that almost all Scottish primary schools use some form of synthetic phonics and that this approach is combined with other strategies in the context of active literacy learning. Schools have a responsibility to respond to the needs of their own pupils. So for me, though, it's a misunderstanding of, of what I'm trying to achieve here. Yes, most schools in Scotland do use some form of phonics, but they're also using these other strategies alongside, such as multi-queuing, which amounts to word guessing. They're also using sight words. They're also using um, repetitive, predictable reading books, which it looks as if children can be in primary one and primary two reading well when they're reading these repetitive books, but effectively what has happened is they are simply memorising the words. So what can happen in schools is then we have um, in primary three or primary four, once we come away from these repetitive texts, children's skills then break down because they don't have enough solid phonics knowledge to attack any new word they come across. Um, I've also had a reply from... John Swinney, this was very recently, this was the 9th of August 2017, um, where he states that he's not convinced it would be helpful to prescribe one particular approach to teaching reading. It would also contradict the philosophy of curriculum for excellence, which empowers teachers to choose the methods best suited to the needs of each child. Um, but again, I feel this shows a, a misunderstanding. I'm, I'm not asking for synthetic phonics to be mandated, uh, to be statutory, as it is in England. I'm simply asking that our teachers are given the access to uh, and are informed about the most current international research um, when it comes to reading. Um, I also have a problem with the idea that it contradicts the philosophy of curriculum for excellence. Um, and I wonder whether we should be prioritising the philosophy of a, curric a curriculum which 
in my eyes, has yet to um, deliver the goods, so to speak, um, whether we should put that or teachers' right to choose from um, a flawed range of strategies. For me, it's more important that children get the correct research-informed reading instruction and that, that shouldn't be left to chance. Okay, thank you very much for that. Michelle Ballantyne? Yes. Good morning. You stated that other countries are getting better faster than Scotland, particularly in terms of beginning reading instructions. Why, why do you think that is the case? Well, as of 2014, um, in England, um, systematic synthetic phonics has been mandated as the sole method for reading instruction. Also in Australia at the moment, they are trialling the phonics screening check, which originated in England. So I feel that lots of countries um, have been for a long time taking note of the research, which ironically really began in Scotland with the Clack Manager research. So other countries seem to be learning the lessons from our research, whereas we have chosen to do nothing and we've chosen to leave it up to teachers. But we've been doing that for the last 12 years and without having all of the information they need, teachers can't. And that's through no fault of them. They can't make an informed decision because they don't, they're do not they not in possession of all the facts or of all the research. So, yes, I'm very concerned um, that in terms of our professionalism, our pedagogy, that, that we're actually falling behind other countries. Can, can, can I, may I just pick up something that Anne said there in terms... I, I don't think, and I'm absolutely sure, synthetic phonics is not a method of teaching reading. It is something that children need to know in able to be able to be able to do it. There are lots of methods that you can use to learn it. It's like saying children need to count in mathematics. Of course, they need to learn to count to be able to do it well. There are lots and lots of ways of teaching them how to count. That's not a method. Synthetic phonics is the same as learning to count. It's a basic skill that they need, that we know when they have it, enables them to read well, as long as it's with all of the other things. But it's not, it's not a restrictive method. Schools can use lots of methods to teach it. It's content, not method. Would it be correct to say that synthetic phonics is not a new idea? Um, I seem to remember that's how I learned to read rather a long time ago. Again. Can I, there is, if you like, an old way of teaching phonics, which has been around quite a long time. The thinking on synthetic phonics has now moved forward mm -hmm. considerably from that. It is a much more complete, rounded system than the one that was used. So, you know, it has something in common with that. Mm -hmm. But what we now mean, which is now why training is so important, the understanding now of synthetic phonics has moved forward quite considerably. Thank you. Thanks, um, Karina. Clearly, um, closing the attainment gap is very much on the radars of, of every single uh, political party in this this parliament. But uh, you, you state um, that there's there's now ample, secure, and compelling evidence which shows that if children are taught to read, write, and spell using a systematic synthetic uh, phonics approach, uh, the attainment gap and the gender gap can be closed. Could you expand on that a bit further, please? So if you can imagine that there are a number of different ways in which you can teach children to read. So one of the ways is by um, encouraging children to use context in order to decipher an unfamiliar word. So a child sees a sentence and there's a word that they don't understand and that they can't read, so they use the context to work that out. A child needs to have good language skills and good vocabulary skills in order to do this effectively, and it's children from disadvantaged backgrounds who typically have the weak vocabulary skills who can't do this. Another approach to teach children to read words is through sight word recognition, where you show them a whole word um, and you ask them to commit that word to memory and remember what that word is. Now, for a lot of children from disadvantaged backgrounds, when they start school, they know almost no letter sounds whatsoever. And so the way in which they remember these words is through visual cues. So they might re remember, for example, in one school that I went into, children were being taught the words biff, chip and floppy. And children remembered the word floppy because it was printed on the largest card. Or they printed the, remembered the word biff because it had the, two, the last two um, letters with the same shape. So these are just abstract, meaning, meaningless symbols to students. Whereas students from more affluent backgrounds, if they're starting school with a knowledge of letter sounds, they might see the word biff, chip and floppy, and they may be making the connections between letter sounds and using that, that approach. 
So you've got use of context, you've got whole word recognition, and then you've got phonics. Now, what phonics does is it redresses these kind of inequalities in knowledge when children start school, because right from the beginning of instruction, you're teaching children about the relationship between letters and sounds, and you're asking them to apply that. So, for example, the first three letter sounds that they might be taught are a, n, t. And then they may be shown the words like, such as ant or at or tan. And then they're shown another letter sound like i. And then they learn to read the words pin, in, it, etc., etc. But what you're creating here is a situation where children from the more disadvantaged backgrounds are getting this critical letter sound knowledge right at the beginning. And you're not teaching children to read by method, which is dependent on vocabulary for good word reading success. And this is the way, I think, in which you would be able to close out the poverty rate of attainment gap in word reading. Um, but obviously, phonics needs to be placed within a curriculum where you're also developing children's oral language skills as well. In, in, in more practical terms, I could take you to hundreds, not thousands, but hundreds of schools where that actually is happening. Uh, and it's children with free school meals, children with uh, English as an additional language, uh, white working class boys, children from difficult, very difficult estates. They have no gap between those children and any other in terms of learning to read. Um, I'd like to just give you an example of some school stats from England to show you how that contrasts and compares with what we have in Scotland. So, for example, in East London we have Elmhurst Primary School. 52% of their pupils are disadvantaged. 96% of their intake have English as a second language. But despite the background, despite the circumstances of their children, they're achieving 94% of their children gaining equivalent of our second level at the end of primary seven in reading. Compare that to our current, our latest figure from teacher judgments was 72%. Um, also, St George's Primary School, again in East London, 71% of their pupils are disadvantaged, 50% have English as a second language, but again, 96% of their pupils, despite background, despite circumstances, are uh, managing to achieve reading uh, at a level that will allow them to flourish and access their secondary school curriculum. I, I know both of those schools. A good number of those 6% or whatever who don't read by the end are children who've actually come to that school partway through the school. Okay, thanks. Put, well, put like that, it's, it's quite a, a compelling case. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Brian? Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, I'm interested in the list of benefits you believe would be achieved through the actions that you're calling for. And, and I, I'm particularly interested in this idea that um, you would be able to reduce the number of children uh, being identified as dyslexic. I wonder if you could expand on that. Um, going back to Elmhurst Primary School, I actually have a quote from the head teacher there who states that since 2014 and the introduction of our synthetic phonics programme, they've actually managed to eradicate dyslexia. Um, so what's sort of happening in some of these schools is they're identifying fewer and fewer children with dyslexia. However, in my current experience, as I travel across Scotland and work with schools and teachers, we appear to be identifying more and more children with dyslexia. And what you will find is that the intervention approaches that absolutely work if someone has been identified as dyslexic are actually based on systematic synthetic phonics. So it's taking that teaching that works where children are struggling and applying that, if you like, to everybody. So it's um, harmful to no one in a class, but beneficial for, for everyone. There is a neurological condition that's best called dyslexia that I think applies to about 1 or 2 per cent of the population, nowhere near the 20 per cent or so who are labelled as dyslexic at the moment. A lot of those children could be taught to read if they were taught to read properly. Okay. Is, is that opinion? No, or is that, no, is that's that, fact. That's you know, that's the, the, you the schools that with the schools that we're talking about, as Anne said, have very few dyslexic children because they read. They 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 all read. No, well, I'm, I'm, the, 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 the fact that you stated there that the, the actual uh, numbers of dyslexia are between one and two percent, uh, as opposed to the twenty percent, and I wonder. Well, is it, that, it, is that it, an evidence based? It, it is evidence based. Yes, okay. the, the, those are the ones who you you can demonstrate clinically have some sort of neurological developmental uh, condition. Most of the others, 
the only real diagnosis for them being dyslexic is that they can't read. I'd be interested to see that, that data, yep. if I may. Um, well, I, we, yes, I haven't got it with me, but okay, we, could, we, could find, we could find you some data on dyslexia. Really, yes, I appreciate yes, that. Yes. Um, but if you remember, it is a controversial area, so people's definition of it do, does okay. change. Uh, you, you also believe that it would be allow us to aim for 100% of children reading in Scotland, and, and can that kind of suggest that that's not the current aim? Uh, is, is that am I correct in my understanding of that? I mean, can I just say, I, I suppose from a research perspective, I believe that synthetic phonics has the potential to improve the literacy skills of children in Scotland. But what we do know is that even with children with the kind of most severest reading difficulties, when they're giving an intervention which aligns with best practice, about 10 to 25 percent of those children still don't respond to those and they have very difficult difficulties which we are not able to kind of um, uh, remediate, I, I suppose. So synthetic phonics is not a cure for all literacy, but it is a way of ensuring that all children achieve better literacy skills and will particularly benefit children from disadvantaged communities. But you cannot promise 100%. 100% 100 is too high. There will always be a few children who, for good reasons, struggle. But I think high 90% is totally achievable. I'd just like to that I did say aim for 100 and I do think we should be aiming for 100% of our children reading in Scotland um, um, and to paraphrase you Gordon we should expect to get very close it will only be in these 2-3% to 3 of cases where there are real and severe difficulties that we will be unable to achieve that. To sort of go back to your question, are we not already aiming for this? Um, this is not current but it will give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. As part of the, the raising attainment for all um, sort of meetings that had been taking place and conferences and so on. Um, this was when um, Angela Constance was Education Secretary. Teachers and schools were signing on the wall, signing up to a commitment, they were signing up to stretch aims. And one of the stretch aims was that we would achieve 85% of our children achieving second level um, in literacy before leaving primary school. And my immediate reaction to that was, well, what about the 15%? I thought this was called raising attainment for all. And if we're serious about raising attainment for all, then we need to be aiming for 100% literacy for all of our children. If you know teaching is being done effectively, then it is easier to identify those few children who have real problems. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, this is happening in England. Um, you said you don't want it to be mandatory here. Um, I'm just interested to know what the, your perception of the national guidance and training for teachers, um, support and resources would be here. And what what do the, what information do you believe teachers don't have here already, you know, to carry this out? I think it's quite difficult. I think the current documentation that we have in Scotland provides a, a very mixed picture. It's very difficult to find real and concrete information. Now, whether you're looking at um, the ease and O's, the experiences and outcomes, the actual curriculum, whether you're looking at the building, the curriculum documents that go along with curriculum for excellence, whether you're looking at the Polar resource, which is the primary one learning assessment and action resource, these all present actually very contradictory things when it comes to reading. So although it, it might appear that at the moment curriculum for excellence isn't prescribing any particular method, actually when you look um, at the experiences and outcomes because they mention site vocabulary, they mention context clues, um, Polar, for example, mentions letter names. These are all things that are part of a whole language approach, which is the opposite of what synthetic phonics is. So even though we think we're not prescribing anything actually by including all of these things, we are. Even within um, the documents themselves, it can be confusing. This is from the Literacy in English Principles and Practice paper. Teachers will balance play-based learning with more systematic development and learning of skills and techniques for reading, including phonics. But then we have this from building the curriculum too, active learning in the early years. There is no long-term advantage to children when there is an overemphasis on systematic teaching before six or seven years of age. 
Um, so the actual documentation there is not helpful for teachers, despite the you know, the size and scope of the Curriculum for Excellence documentation, which, if you're familiar with the, the green glossy folder, which is enormous, it, it weighs six and a half pounds, um, there's only a couple of lines um, on actual um, reading instruction there. Um, I explore sounds, letters and words, discovering how they work together. Um, I can use my knowledge of sight vocabulary, phonics, context clues, punctuation and grammar to read with understanding and expression. <coughs> I am learning to select and use strategies and resources before I read and as I read to help make the meaning of texts clear. And that, that really is your lot. Despite reference to strategies six times in the document, it doesn't outline what those strategies are. But in many cases, these are being interpreted as um, multi-queuing strategies. So to give you an example, you've already... Sorry, sorry can I just stop you? Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could just answer specific, specifically. Mm -hmm. Do you think teachers are informed enough about this? Would they need special training? Teachers do need special training. In the course of my day-to-day -day work, I regularly speak to audiences of teachers. Over the last three years, I've started now asking every audience for a show of hands, please put your hand up if when you were, did your teacher training you were taught um, how to teach reading. Um, my most recent example of this with a big audience, 72 teachers in Scotland, um, I had three hands up mm -hmm. and one of those teachers trained in South Africa, mm -hmm. um, one trained at Murray House. <laughs> um, I, I thought... Um, I had slept in the day that teaching reading was covered. I thought this was a, a, a personal a problem for myself, something that I had missed, something that I lacked. But through my research, through speaking to teachers, I've discovered that we, we all have lacked access to this information. When, when I said that these levels of attainment were possible, I very, very genuinely mean that. I never said it was easy. It has been a real uphill struggle in England partly because there is such an extensive need for training, and that often includes the people who are providing the training at the moment, which makes life very difficult. And also, there is 30 years of real ingrained prejudice and conservative thinking amongst teachers and teacher trainers that, you know, have this anti-phonics attitude that it is not to do with comprehension, that it is not to do with enjoyment um, of books, and that has been very very, very hard to uh, deal with and get past. Mm. That's, that was one of the points I was going to yeah. raise. Teachers often complain that you know they're subjected yes. to too much change in, in, in curriculums and teaching methods. This would be another change, presumably. Well, and would you accept that you, you, resources are very stretched at the moment for, to allow the training of teachers to do this? Yes, but we're talking about a change from 20% of children not being able to read to almost all children being able to read. Uh, do not some changes just have to happen? I know it's not popular with teachers. I know they don't like it. But, you know, we are failing thousands and thousands of children who, who could be given that gift of reading, which opens the door to so many other things, uh, educationally and in life and um, opportunities and everything. It is a price. Okay. My opinion is that it's a price that has to be paid. Finally, Michelle. Yes, thank you. In your petition, you suggest that by having national guidance to follow, teachers will be able to adapt their classroom practice accordingly. How would you address any of the potential concerns that having guidance to adhere to would restrict teachers' professional autonomy? Um, so, I mean, in terms of how synthetic phonics programmes can be delivered, there are a number of different ways in which they can be delivered. For example, they vary in the number of letter sound mappings which are taught, in the speed and pace of delivery, in the reading materials that accompany them, and in many other ways as well. So it's about understanding synthetic phonics and then understanding the specific students that you're teaching, what their needs are, and then adjusting the pace of your delivery, the number of letter sound mappings that you teach, based on the knowledge of your students. Um, so it's about sort of, I guess, educating teachers on the topic so that they do feel confident to be able to adjust it to their classes. Uh, it, it, it's a matter of, um, I, I, I don't think, in, to, being honest with you now, I don't think in position as such has worked in England. Those teachers that are doing it have been persuaded and shown mm -hmm. all the evidence and, and why. Uh, it works so well, and I don't know any teachers who are doing it, but remember, I think it's content. You're asking teachers to look at specific content, not at a particular method uh, of delivery. So it's not. 
it Can is what they're teaching, not how they're teaching it, that's, uh, that's important. Yeah, it, it's interesting you, you raise that, that what, you know, you have to show them and they have to engage yeah. with it. Is your experience that once you've shown a teacher or a teacher has come with that knowledge, that their engagement is then high and that they, they then find synthetic phonics the, 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 the primary way that they would choose to teach? I, I know of no teachers who are doing it well who would want to do it any mm. other way because they can see that their children can, can read and can read with understanding and are enthusiastic and love books. And so this is, this is about outcomes, ultimately. Yes, but it's also about finding a way of mm -hmm. getting people to understand of winning hearts and minds. And the, you know, the evidence is there, mm -hmm. but yes, it's really hard work to get them to look at it. Really hard. How long does it take to train a teacher in synthetic phonics? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I offer professional learning sessions which last for five hours, and at the end, teachers feel confident, I think, that they understand it enough to be able to, um, to deliver it, and you, you do the same. That big a challenge. It's, it's really, it's not that, no. Two days would be good, I think. Mm -hmm. A day is, is possible, but it's pushing. A day with follow-up might be possible, two days, a few hours, no. And then it's professional practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can I thank you very much for that? I think that has been... Really interesting. One thing I would say, my re recollection is pre two thousand and eleven, the Labour Party had a commission on literacy. It was headed up by Rona Brankin at that time, and it talked about synthetics, synthetic phonics, and it was accepted by the Scottish government at that time. I think Mike Russell was the education minister. So this is something that there has been a conversation on. Equally, I sit in the education committee, and we had an evidence session with um, a group of. Uh, people who are in initial teacher education and they were concerned about the level of support they got in learning how to, um, to you know, literacy and numeracy was a very much a concern. So I think it's something that people are alive to as an issue I and mean, I think people found that the, you, you, your presentation very, very interesting, I think. I wonder what we think we should do in terms of taking this forward. Angus? Yeah, um, thanks, Camilla. Uh, just following on from your comment there about the, the work uh, Rona Brankin's uh, team, team did, um, <clears throat> I think it's worth pointing out that in 2010, uh, Mike Russell, the, the Cabinet Secretary for Education at the time, said, I agree that synthetic ph phonics has had considerable success. So that begs the question, if it was considered to have considerable success way back in 2010, then why has it not um, moved, moved forward and become more, more commonplace? Um, so I, I think the petitioners have made a, a, a very compelling case uh, for syn synthetic uh, phonics, particularly with regard to the evidence um, uh, of children from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds particularly benefiting. So uh, I think we need to go back to the Scottish Government and ask what their current view is, um, and uh, also uh, seek the opinion of the EIS and the GTC in Scotland. I think the other unions as well, as well as EIS, the SST and um, NESUWT and other um, unions would be useful. Brian? Just uh, follow on from Angus there is, is that if we're going to write to the Scottish Government, I think we've had a, a, a sort of generic response, if you like. Uh, the petitioners already uh, um, indicated that they, they had a response from the Cabinet Secretary. If we're going to ask that question, could, perhaps we could ask that question in reference to mm -hmm. comments from 2010. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and also, uh, including the letter, the, the evidence today that um, there's particular ben benefit to children from disadvantaged backgrounds. Could we also ask for the evidence against using and embedding synthetic phonics? Because, uh, you know, it seems to suggest there's a resistance from the Cabinet Secretary, and I'd like to know why, what that's based on. Mm -hmm. In the context of professional responsibility and understanding, it's not completely random. You can just do whatever you like, and I don't think any teacher would argue that that's what autonomy meant. But it feels as if that letter um, suggests that. But that's something that we can obviously explore with the. It was an issue, and, and it, it was briefly highlighted or mentioned by by the petitioners that if those who are delivering teacher training don't know how to do it, they can't teach it, and therefore some resistance might come from that as well. So I, I think we should explore that with the Cabinet Secretary as well. Could I very respectfully make one suggestion? It might not be your way forward, it might be into the, into the future. 
I, I think dissemination of good practice is one of the most effective ways rather than imposing it on people. You know, f identify people who are already doing it well and get them to share their practice with other schools so that it, it's, it's school to school rather than top down. Some of it is about confidence. I'm, I'm very struck yeah. about the evidence that we now have a, a, a strategy for teaching children to learn reading which enhances the opportunities for those who already are advantaged because they've got those skills because yeah, they've been yeah. you know and so a, a mechanistic approach which then affords the opportunity to then learn from the other stuff you can see in terms i mean i just find that very compelling that we're, we've actually got strategies that are based on success that are already there and not on understanding the disadvantage the young some some young people might have i don't it may be something I don't know whether there are other educationalists and kind of the thinkers in Scotland, particularly around the colleges and universities who are doing initial teacher education, whether they have a view on this, maybe something else that we could explore. Anything else? No? In that case, can I thank you very much for your attendance today? I think that was um, certainly very interesting and it, it will be useful to explore why something appears logical is perhaps you know there are people have got some concerns about it and I think that's how we would want to take it forward but can I thank you very much for your attendance today and we'll suspend until um, we allow the witnesses to um, move. Can um, call the meeting back to order. The third item on today's agenda is the further consideration of continuing petitions. I would say, just to um, alert this to the committee, my sense is that we will not be able to get through the very substantial number of petitions that are here um, by 20 to 12, and I would rather that we took time to do them properly rather than rattle through them quickly. I think each uh, petition needs a bit of time in its, in its own merit, so if we don't manage to deal with them all, then obviously we will deal with them at our, our next meeting. Um, but members may wish to note that I intend to deviate slightly from the order of petitions listed in agenda and take petition 1591 last. This is to provide an opportunity for Kate Forbes to attend for the discussion of this petition um, in which she's taken an interest. And Kate also has to attend the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, which is meeting this morning, but it's to be hoped um, that she'll be able to join us later, if indeed we manage to get to that petition at all. Um, the first two petitions for consideration are Petition 1480 on Alzheimer's and Dementia Awareness and Petition 1533 on the abolition of non-residential social care charges for older and disabled people, which we have previously joined together for consideration. At the last consideration of these petitions in May, members agreed to write to the Scottish Government for details of a feasibility study relating to extending free personal care to people under the age of 65. The committee also asked the Scottish Government to meet with both petitioners to discuss their views on the study. The Scottish Government responses in relation to the two petitions are provided in our meeting papers. The petitioner for Petition 1480, Amanda Capel, highlighted in her written submission to the committee the value of considering both petitions together. She recognised that at the time of writing her submission, work had begun to explore the extension of free personal care to under 65s. However, this would not address other services that people with dementia and other long-term conditions rely on, such as day services. 
In September, the Scottish Government's programme for government for 2017-18 was published, and it outlines plans to implement Frank's Law, which will provide free personal care to those under 65 who need it. Members will note that the Government provided a further update earlier this week, with a link to the feasibility study being provided, along with information about the planned implementation of free personal care for under 65s. I wonder if members have any thoughts or suggestions for further action on these petitions. Angus. Um, thanks, um, I'm, I'm certainly pleased that the, the Scottish Government has uh, engaged and met with Amanda Capella on a, a number of occasions, and of course uh, I'm delighted that the Scottish Government's programme for government has included uh, a commitment to, to implement Frank's law. So um, clearly, uh, between the work of the petitioner, the petitioner, um, and uh, the, obviously the media interest that that, that, that has recently been seen uh, in the the issue uh, has has uh, secured uh, an end result um, that's welcomed by anyone, uh, everyone. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, however, there, there is there is still the issue of uh, uh, extending to um, other services such as as day services. Um, which don't currently come under the definition of free personal care. So uh, I think uh, uh, there are still aspects of this petition that need to be pursued. Yep. Anyone else? Um, yeah, uh, the, there, there was a feasibility study being done by the government um, on, on that issue, which I think was due to be completed by summer this year. So I don't think we, we know the outcome of that. So I think we should write to the government and ask them um, what the outcome is. To update us. But I think we've got a link to that. Rona. Have we? we so have we do know that. So that they, they've given us an update on that. Oh, I right. suppose the other question I would ask, which I think perhaps the other petition is concerned about, that, <coughs> um, and I think there has been very significant progress, and we should commend the, the petitioners and the progress that's been made and the government on responding to that, mm -hmm. but that there are issues around um, conditions that are not mm -hmm. dementia, yes. and there is an anxiety around what that means for. Um, uh, other people who are, who are relying on these services. I mean, there's a, a, the whole um, um, scrap the care tax campaign is predicated on this idea that really it's an issue of human rights. The people have been denied the opportunity to achieve their potential because they can't access um, um, services. I wonder whether that is something that we can you know, can raise with them. This what is their intention beyond um, dementia, but to other conditions that have that kind of impact on people's lives. Yeah. Michelle? Uh, yeah, I, I, th I think we should go back. I think we should, as, as Angus has said, that we should commend the government on, on the decision to support Frank's law. But I think we should probe that question further that, you know, there are a number of conditions other than Alzheimer's that find themselves in the same place. And okay. uh, I'd like to know what the thoughts are around that. Brian? It's my understanding that, that, that it will extend beyond to just the sort of dementia, but to what extent, I'm not sure. So yeah, I think we have to just ask, yeah. ask, the, ask the question. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay, if that's agreed, we go back to the Scottish Government really to get a clarification of what the plans are perhaps beyond the feasibility study in terms of, of taking that forward. We do recognise that there has been um, progress in that regard. Okay, um, if we can then move on to petition... Uh, 1551 on mandatory reporting of child abuse. This next continued petition for consideration is by Scott Patterson on mandatory reporting of child abuse. At our previous consideration of this petition in June, we considered the Scottish Government's position for not consulting on mandatory, mandatory reporting. Members will recall that the Government's position was that while it would be entirely within the Parliament's competence to take its own approach on this issue, it would be, in their words, prudent to await the outcome of the UK Government's consultation. The committee considered that the submissions that have been received from children's organisations in relation to this petition demonstrate that there are people and organisations who want to engage in a discussion on this issue. We agreed that any discussion should be in the context of the child protection system in Scotland and invited the Scottish Government to provide a response to these points once it had reflected in the committee's consideration. An update had not been provided by the time our papers for this meeting were issued. However, an update was provided on Tuesday of this week and has been circulated to members. 
In that response, the Scottish Government acknowledges that the context around matters of child protection in Scotland differs in a number of ways to that in England and Wales, and recognises that any analysis of responses to the UK Government's consultation would require to be considered within a Scottish context. The submission indicates that the UK Government officials have confirmed with Scottish Government officials that responses to the UK Government consultation are currently being reviewed, with no indication of when the findings will be published. The Scottish Government indicates that it, quote, has had informal engagement with key stakeholders in the matter of mandatory reporting, which expects to continue. It indicates that it will provide the committee with an update on any outcomes from this informal engagement in February 2018. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for further action. Michelle? I'm not sure do anything until we get that, that feedback, really. I mean... You know, I mean, I, obviously, we've no idea when the UK, you know, the, the UK government are going to report, but I certainly think we need to wait till we've got the the feedback from the Scottish government on their informal engagements. Um, I'm not sure I would go in the interim bit with it. Mm -hmm. I think it, I think it would Nora? be it would be um, sensible to to maybe write to the Minister for Childcare in early years to ask her to um, request the the information from the UK government about about the time frame. To give us a, a, a steer. I'm still at a loss why it's got anything to do with that, to be yeah, honest. I mean, I kind of get that you want to... Well, I don't know if I do get it, because I think they have accepted that there is a different regime in Scotland, and indeed, so many of the things, you know, that actually the landscape around child protection is quite different. Um, although a lot of the issues around um, um, child abuse, the report of child abuse, mm -hmm. is no... Um, respecter of boundaries or borders or mm. class or anything else. So I, mean, I, I I'm do sure understand. It would just be that. for information, just yeah. to see what direction they're going in. I think but we would. It's that issue of mandatory reporting and yeah. what with the implications on people of imposing mandatory reporting, um, which, if somebody's doing a, a proper study, it's just useful to see what yeah. they find. Um, but you know, ultimately, I, I, you know, it won't mean there's a natural fit. Mm. So, but uh, you know. But um, maybe the fact ask, that, but that there's been a wee bit of progress in the sense that they've got this informal mm. engagement, they're saying they're going to report back on mm. that in February, and we could maybe reflect on it further yeah. mm -hmm. once they've done that and indicate to them that we're very keen mm. that that is done. Um, we do feel that there's been perhaps delay for mm. understandable reasons, but yeah. it's not really grappling with the issues that the, the petition has identified. And while, whilst I have a very empathy with the petition on this, I don't think this is something you could you rush either because it could have huge implications and I think it needs to be looked at quite carefully. Okay, so we're agreeing to um, get an update from the Scottish Government in February but to urge them that there's an engagement we hope that could take place. Um, okay, if we can move on uh, to the next petition, which is Petition 1577 on Adult Cerebral Palsy Services. The committee last considered this petition in May and agreed to write to the Scottish Government to ask for the details of a pilot programme and a mapping exercise and whether it be minded to develop national guidance on adults with cerebral palsy based on this work. The Scottish Government's response states that the clinical standards for neurological health services are currently under review by Healthcare Improvement Scotland and that the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence are developing guidance for the management and treatment of cerebral palsy in adults, which will be published in 2019. As such, the Scottish Government is not minded to develop separate guidance on adults with cerebral palsy. The petitioner's written submission welcomes the guidelines currently being developed but questioned whether there was an opportunity for the Scottish Government to provide leadership rather than waiting for guidelines to be developed. The petitioner also expressed concern that the Scottish Government had not contacted her despite making a commitment to work with her. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Michelle. I think we should take the um, petitioner's request seriously to write to the Minister and ask why there hasn't been any further engagement with the petitioner. Um, when it was specifically stated there would. I mean, there obviously is a gap here in, in the system, but I think the first step is, is to ask why that further engagement hasn't taken place. Okay. Was that, yeah. mm -hmm. and I think it is actually very important because it there is. seems to be a kind of a mismatch in the discussion. Yeah, there is. That, oh, There's you can do this connection. in the petition, saying, but that actually, you know, the transition to adult safe doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. You know, all the, There's quite a number of <coughs> uh, examples in the, in the briefing where it feels as if 
the dialogue is, is so kind of make, missing yeah. the point. It looks like yeah. a standard response as opposed to a response to a specific question, and I think that's the issue. Mm -hmm. Anything else we could be doing? No, Angus? Um, well, sorry, should, should we not be writing to um, NICE to clarify um, what opportunity there might be for the, the petitioner to um, yes. contribute to the work on developing the guidance? Yeah. I think that would make sense as well. If the sense is that the lived experience is not shaping the guidance, mm. then how do people who've got these concerns um, develop that? I think that would be useful as well. Yeah. In case really nice are engaging with people with cerebral palsy, maybe not this particular petitioner, but I think it's worth asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. If that's agreed, then, and I think we would be want to write the Scottish Government to ensure that they fulfil their commitment um, to the petitioner, because that in itself would be a, would, would give confidence that those concerns are being um, recognised. Our next petition is Petition 1581, Save Scotland School Libraries, by Duncan Wright, on behalf of Save Scotland School Libraries. Our last consideration of this petition was on the 25th of May. We agreed to ask the Deputy First Minister to respond to the petitioner's request for clarification of the development and delivery of the national strategy and when the strategy would be in place. In a submission at the end of June, the Scottish Government advised that the Scottish Library an information council will lead on the development of the strategy, but will engage key stakeholders, including the Chartered Institute of Library and Information Professionals in Scotland and the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland. It added that development engagement would begin following publication of the guidance on school libraries, How Good Is Our School For?, with the aim of agreeing and publishing ahead of the 2018-19 school year. The clerk's note indicates that the guidance on school libraries has been published and refers to the recent announcement by the Deputy First Minister of the School Library Improvement Fund. The petitioner considers that significant progress has been made with a clear plan for development and delivery of the strategy to an appropriate timescale. Do members have any comments or suggestions for action? I suggest we close the petition. She seems quite happy. I think it, you know, thanks to the committee and I think... There doesn't seem any further work to do, yeah. really. Yeah, I think we can welcome the progress yeah, to me. Yeah, it's been I think successful. it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's good to recognise that this is a petition that has achieved what the petitioner wanted, that the government has responded to, mm -hmm. it, and there seems to be a clear line yep. of action. So um, on that basis, I think we would be agreeing to close the petition. Yep. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Nice to close one occasion. <laughs> Um, I'll skip the next one. Okay. Um, the next petition we're going to deal with, because we're going to um, take the, the one on health services later. The next one is petition 1625 on wider awareness, acceptance and recognition of pathological demand avoidance syndrome. The next petition is petition 1625 by Patricia Hewitt and Mary Black on wider awareness, acceptance and recognition of pathological demand avoidance syndrome. Submission from the Scottish Government, integration joint boards and the petitioners are included in the annex to the paper provided for us. At our meeting on 15th June, we agreed to ask the Scottish Government whether it would look at policies, research or approaches elsewhere in the world. In its submission, the Scottish Government states that it has a... <coughs> excuse me is already committed to international standards of best practice in the form of ICD-10 and DSM-5. It adds that the relevant national guidance, SIGN 145, was published as recently as 2016 and reflects the most recent evidence covering children and young people following a systematic review and critical appraisal of the current scientific literature. As such, the Scottish Government is clear that it does not intend to look at policies, research or practice elsewhere. The Scottish Government also addressed our question about how consistency in diagnosis and support can be delivered by local authorities. It notes that under the Scottish Strategy for Autism, each local authority is required to have a published autism strategy and autism plan. The submission also refers to the availability and accessibility of a range of support tools and learning resources, including the autism training framework, an online learning space, and a guidance document titled Key Considerations in Promoting Positive Practice for Autism Spectrum Disorders. 
That document advises all staff to be, quote, sensitive to differences in how individuals and their families or carers wish to view themselves and how they wish to describe their autism. The submission from integration joint boards also referred to the national and international guidance as being the gold standard. They appear to indicate that they will adhere to this guidance but update any practices in the event of any changes being put in place based on any emerging evidence. The um, IGBs, particularly Orton and Shetland, highlight the importance of developing individualised strategies with child-centred and solution-orientated interventions as part of a positive behaviour support plan for the individual rather than the label. The petitioner considers that the Scottish Government has, quote, no willingness to address new developments and that the submissions from the IGBs reflect the varied handling of PDA across the country, where only those professionals with an awareness of the condition will respond <laughs> accordingly. The petitioners present some proposals for further consideration, and I wonder if members have any views on action to take on this petition. If I, could, um, Brian? I think this, I was particularly struck with this uh, petition. Um, we took the evidence around the the, the, the apparent um, postcode lottery in terms of. Um, how the how treatment was brought forward or not treatment was brought forward with you know between one council area uh, recognising and treating and another council area perhaps even sending them to parent classes and, and I'm still not convinced that we've got a response here that that, that satisfies that. I'm I'm not satisfied with the responses at the moment that that would uh, address that particular issue so I'm not quite sure how we take that forward but I'm slightly disquieted by. In fact, I don't mm -hmm. think we've got to where I'd hoped we would get to. I thought, suppose I felt a bit encouraged by the, um, some of the evidence which said, well, regardless of what the term is, your focus needs to be on the child and how they how they behave and how they're, they're living this. So even although they're not prepared to put that title on the condition, the practice that says how that condition pre presents itself is what your focus should be. I don't know whether that is... Um, you know, of, of some comfort to people, it feels quite difficult for us to be able to adjudicate on the kind of the um, professional understanding of these conditions. No, I, 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 I absolutely accept that. Um, I'm just voicing the fact that I'm not convinced that we've, we've addressed what was most disquieting to me. You know, you know the fact that I was suggesting that some people have been sent for, you know, for good parenting classes <laughs> rather than treating the child, and, and I just want to. Understand, as you say, whether you call it PDA or whatever you call it, mm -hmm. that, there is, that, that there is a child centred focus uh, in the condition. I think the, um, the complexity of, of the autistic spectrum and the complexity of, of behaviours that you see on it does make it very challenging. And um, PDA is, is, is an emerging conversation. Um, so you will see it in clinical notes in some places, and in other places it will be denied as, a, as an existing. Um, condition on the autistic spectrum. I think part of the problem is some of the behaviours that um, are displayed under PDA can appear like um, poor behaviour and therefore are often determined to be poor behaviour in, in, a, in a child and, and therefore are related to a, a parent's, um, if you like, unwillingness to set boundaries and demand better behaviours. Um, and I think that's where some of the complexity comes in, um, and that depends very much on on the individuals who are making that assessment, um, and that can be very challenging for parents, um, and it can raise anxiety levels to to quite a high level. Um, I think what the petitioners are asking for is a conversation about this, mm. um, and I think that is quite important. Um, particularly in an emerging conversation, emerging, emerging potential clinical diagnosis, where there is a disputed existence between clinicians. Um, but it, it is only disputed in the sense that the learning curve is still fairly early on, um, and the evidence base um, is, is not universally accepted. Um, so that is going to be challenging. It's not something we can push on to everybody. But I think um, what we are perhaps asking for is an open-minded approach to looking at it and an open-minded approach to how we treat parents and individuals. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that um, 
the issue here is about not slamming the door. Mm. It, it's about saying actually that there needs to be an ongoing review of what this means and what this means for families, what this means mm -hmm. for children, what it means for for families, because it's not just about parents, it's about siblings, it's about grandparents, aunts and uncles mm -hmm. who are trying to cope with, with what can be quite extreme behaviour in some cases. The question we have to ask is whether we as a petitions committee, in terms of actually continuing to look at the petition, help that process. I would have thought the fact that we've raised it with the integrated joint boards, it's now an issue they've had to respond to, they've been more aware of it. Um, I certainly am comfortable with the fact that that focus on the child mm -hmm. and the fact that there's been an airing of the condition is something that we can usefully do. The question is whether we have neither the expertise nor probably the detailed understanding of how practice develops um, to influence that. I would possibly argue that we've already influenced it and what we've already done. So the judgment we have mm -hmm. to make now is continuing to bring back the petition do we do do we add anything, or have we done our job in the sense that we've highlighted this? Um, that that conversation should be continuing. And certainly, if we were to close it, the petitioners are obviously able to come back again if they feel as if there hasn't been progress. Well, I don't. I mean, we obviously can't probably change or influence it directly, DSM or ICD D, um, diagnostics. But I suppose what we can do is make a re make a recommendation, or if we feel appropriate that professionals um, have an awareness and continue to to look at where PDA sits mm -hmm. um, on the autistic spectrum and, and you know I mean I in my you know in my own professional life I've seen that as a you know as an awareness growing area but like all these things it takes time mm -hmm. um, and it takes research and, and things that will actually then back up or deny existence. I mean in so. terms of what we decide um, I'm not if people have other um, suggestions, please share them with us. But our decision is whether we, in closing the petition, can we just confirm to the Scottish Government that we believe there's an issue here, there has been responses, we believe this conversation needs to continue, mm -hmm. um, and that we, we recognise the focus, the significant, that the way in which autism and other conditions express themselves mean that you do, it is essential as a it really is a focus on child. I mean, we're teaching people who understand far more about this. Um, yeah. you know, I'm not trying to teach somebody how to do their job. They clearly know an awful lot more of the detail than I do. But I wondered, even in closing it, if we could make that kind of recommendation to the Scottish Government. I think so. I, mean, I think I think Brian's um, comments are particularly relevant in the sort of patchiness of, of approaches from different local authorities. And I don't know whether local authorities have been made aware enough about it, and I don't know whether we could include that in the in the request that, you know, to encourage, as, as the petitioners want, encourage local authorities to provide um, training and education to social care professionals or at least make them aware of it. Um, and I don't know if we could, you know, as you say, if we closed the petition but then requested that, that this... I don't know if we've done that enough. I don't know if local authorities... Otherwise, why is there such a sort of, you know, mm -hmm. patchy... Because response. Of cases. Mm -hmm. Might I suggest yeah. that, that in closing it, we, we do flag up the Scottish Government that this is something you should be aware of uh -huh. in developing the Scottish strategy for autism mm -hmm. um, and that they should be yes. you know, aware of the start of a conversation. Around the condition. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that agreed? Yeah. Okay, in that case, um, if we're, we're agreeing to close the condition in those terms, we would want to thank the petitioners very much for. <laughs> bringing this attention to the attention of the committee and through us to the integrated joint boards and, and highlighting um, the very specific concerns about a condition that's possibly ending up and people getting all sorts of um, varied recommendations now the matter should be treated and we wouldn't want that to be the case. Okay, in that case, if we can move on to petition 1633 um, on private criminal prosecution in Scotland, which we last considered at our meeting in June 2017. At that meeting, we agreed to write to the Scottish Government, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and the Health and Safety Executive in Scotland to ask for their views on whether they considered there to be an accountability gap in relation to health and safety investigations in Scotland. The Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service stated that it does not have the statutory authority to instruct the Health and Safety Executive in relation to its work. It went on to confirm that this was no different from the relationship between the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and all other agencies which report 
suspected criminality to the Procurator Fiscal. The petitioner's written submission set out concerns in relation to the existing health and safety uh, executive guidelines in the context of sports-related injuries. He stated that, as the guidelines currently stand, unless someone is killed at a sporting event, it's very unlikely that there will ever be an independent investigation into an injury. The petition's view is that there is a failure by the health and safety executive and identified three alternative options to address this perceived failure as set out in our meeting papers. And I wonder if members have any comments for suggestion for further action. Rona? Yeah, well, just can I say that this um, petitioner is a constituent of mine, and I think there is a real issue, there is a very real issue here. Um, he highlights um, a really important um, sort of anomaly in the system. I am just not sure that we can take it I, any further, because I think we've, we've exhausted all avenues of um, inquiry on this one, and we just seem to be hitting a, a brick wall, so... Is there, a, is there a case to refer to another committee? Which one? Not a don't, don't give it back to me. <laughs> I want to give it to somebody else. I, I, think, I actually thought it, was a really, I thought it was a really interesting argument mm -hmm. which said that an in, unless there's a fatality, in which case there's an inquiry, mm -hmm. but if somebody's seriously injured at a sporting event, where there may have been culpability, I mean, maybe you know more about this than me, but... I was thinking was there a gymnastics competition where somebody's failed to you know, make sure that the, the equipment is, is safe. That's not investigated. Mm -hmm. I was quite it's surprised by that. Yeah. Well, I think it's a legal issue. Yeah. Uh, and I just wondered whether or not... I, I'm, I'm not sure we can do anything. That's what I, that, I, I don't know where we can go with it. And there, is, there is an undoubted issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is also an... Inter um, we looked at this um, round which powers we would devolve to the Scottish Parliament, and I mean by we in one party. And there's an interesting issue around how the Health and Safety Executive Scotland sits yes. and how it sits in relation to the UK body and how it sits in relation to accountability yeah. um, in Scotland. But I'm, I'm not sure if it's something that we could address, but I'm quite attracted by the idea of, of referring to another committee. Um, I know this was something that routinely happened in the past and we very rarely do it now, but... Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think it merits further discussion and investigation. I'm just not sure that this is the this is the vehicle. I suppose the only question would be: we would not want to mislead the petitioner that referring it to mm -hmm. the Justice Committee, which may have a very and I know does have a very significant workload, would mm -hmm. actually be able to address it. Well, I, I agree that we, I don't think this is the place to, to for it to be addressed. So that only what leaves us. The option of preparing to the Justice Committee, I think. Any views? Well, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on the Justice Committee. <laughs> I'm happy for it to go there. Okay. That's but, right, that's uh, settled the matter then. You spoke on behalf of the Justice, <laughs> justice Committee. <laughs> and anybody who gives me a row about it, a referral concerns to yourself. I do think that... <laughs> There's a hole you've just dug. Exactly. <laughs> you want to take it forward, can I don't you? Think we want, I don't think we want to create the impression that we think this is something that's easily solved. We no. do think it's an interesting area, but we don't feel the petition committee can take it yeah. um, further. So on that uh, basis, we would be agreeing um, to close the petition under Rule 15.7 of standing orders. Is that right? No. OK. OK, I'm getting my technical advice right here. Mm -hmm. OK, in that case, we're not agreeing to close it. We are agreeing to refer it, refer it. to mm -hmm. the Justice um, Committee. Okay. Um, and in doing so, we would want to thank the petitioner we're highlighting it to ourselves. OK, we can move on then to petition 1648, nursery business rates. Um, the next petition is petition 1648, nursery business rates, which calls for business rates for nurseries to be abolished or frozen. The committee last considered this petition in June and agreed to seek the views of the Scottish Government, Voice Union, Parenting Across Scotland and local authorities. A number of submissions have been received which provided the committee with useful information. However, this appears to be an instance where consideration of the petition has been overtaken by events. Since we last considered the petition, the Barclay Review of the Non-Domestic Rate System has been published and the Scottish Government has announced that childcare nurseries should benefit from a new 100% rate relief from 2018-19. This will be subject to review after three years. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for further action. 
absolutely delighted that the decision has been made. And we can close the petition, I think. And take credit for it. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I, like think so. well, I think that might be a stretch, but <laughs> no, can't be any. Yeah, and no, I think it is one of those ones where yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the petitions have clearly been active, not just mm -hmm. in terms of the petition committee, but there's been a campaign round yeah. this whole question. The Scottish government has responded yeah. to that, so we would be agreeing um, to close the petition under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders on the basis the Scottish government has agreed that childcare nurseries should benefit from a new 100% rate relief from 2000. 1819. And if we can then move on to our next petition, petition 1649 on council tax bans. The committee last considered this petition in June and agreed to write to the Scottish Government and COSLA seeking their views on the petition. The Scottish Government stated that while it recognised the concerns raised by the petitioner, there has no plans to undertake a revaluation exercise for council tax purposes during the current parliamentary term. In contrast, COSLA is of the view that a wholesale revaluation of council tax bans is required as part of a wider strategic review of council tax in Scotland to make the system a fair and locally democratically accountable tax. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for further action. Michelle? Well, I sat on the COSLA's review of local government taxation and we spent an awful lot of time on it. So. Um, <laughs> It's a difficult one. I mean, to some degree, we are where we are. I mean, you know, the recommendations have been made. Uh, the Scottish Government made it clear they're not going to look at it again at the moment. Um, I'm not sure where we do go in, to be honest, at this stage, because there's been such a, a huge amount of conversation about it already to date. Thank you. Um, well, <coughs> given um, Michelle's comments and um, uh, the, the, the position we find ourselves in, I, I, I don't think there's any option uh, but to, to close the petition, um, given that the Scottish Government have stated they've got no plans to, to undertake a revaluation exercise. Um, I think if we, if we were to ask the Scottish Government to comment on COSLA's submission, we're just basically going to get the same response. So rather than prolong the agony, um, we're probably better just closing the petition, Regret, regretfully. Yeah, I think it, it would be worth just saying to the petition that this will be an ongoing conversation. Um, just because we close the petition doesn't mean that the conversation dies. Mm -hmm. um, this is an ongoing conversation between local government, between COSLA, between, mm. you know, political parties. I mean, it's, it's not a dead subject. Yeah. 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 I think there are some mm. petitions which highlight an issue that nobody's paying any attention to mm -hmm. and no focus on. The reality is that in terms of council tax, I think everyone is wrestling with how do you... Alternatives, um, yeah have a fair mm -hmm. local taxation, which is locally, um, yeah. locally accountable. And I think all parties in the parliament and beyond mm -hmm. are, are wrestling with that. But I think that um, I, think I would agree with members that um, we recognise it is a really important issue. We also recognise that people are wrestling with it as we speak. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the petitions role, petition committee's role, uh, we've probably done as much as we can at this stage. Absolutely and we'd be agreeing to close the petition on that basis. Mm -hmm. um, but the Scottish Government has no plans to undertake a revaluation exercise during the current parliamentary term, but we would highlight the fact this is an issue that remains to be... It's a live um, issue. A very mm -hmm. live issue, and it remains mm -hmm. to be resolved. And we'd want to thank the petitioners for bringing it to the attention of the committee. Mm -hmm. um, if we can then move on to uh, the next petition for consideration, which is petition 1650, which relates to the student awards agency for Scotland's postgraduate eligibility criteria. We last considered this petition in June and at that meeting agreed to write to the Scottish Government, the National Union of Students Scotland, the Student Awards Agency Scotland and University Scotland. Responses have now been received as well as a written submission from the petitioner and this information is included within our meeting papers. The majority of written responses received do not support the action called for by the petition, believing that the current policies in place work well for the vast majority of students. And I wonder if, <coughs> excuse me, if com uh, members have any comments or suggestions for further action. I think it would be, given the lack of support for it, it would be difficult to just justify continuing the petition, to be honest. I, I agree. I think, I think what's the point? I think it should be closed now because we've had all the responses and they're quite um, unequivocal. So I, I think it should be closed. Mm -hmm. 
I think, I think the evidence is quite clear in this one. And I think that whilst you, know, you might have empathy with what the petitioner is saying, the reality is, is not supported. Mm -hmm. so. I, mean, I think it comes down to the fact that the only students in Europe that don't have um, access to the same conditions as Scotland does are those from England. And the, the, you know, the, and not the, the fact that the qualification the person was seeking is one that was really only a benefit in Scotland. So you can see why it wouldn't be funded elsewhere. But I think it's probably within a broader mix of what's going to happen in student support in the, in the longer term. Yeah. Um, I think we're in the same conversation almost as last time, that all of this will be an ongoing subject of debate. So closing this petition doesn't mean this will never be discussed mm -hmm. and looked at again, because it will be. OK, so are we agreeing to close the petition um, under Rule 15.7 of standing orders on the basis that there, is, there isn't support for the action called for in the petition, but we would want to thank the petitioner again, recognising you know, the petitioner's particular individual circumstance, which is clearly very frustrating, um, but that it is, um, and it's been important to highlight that, but it is in this broader context of student support. Is that agreed? Yes, agreed. Yeah. Okay, um, the next petition for consideration today, which possibly will be the last one, is petition 1652 on abusive and threatening communication. The committee last considered this petition in June and agreed to write to relevant stakeholders. Responses have now been received and are included within our meeting papers. Police Scotland and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service both highlighted that the main challenge that exists in enforcing abusive and threatening communication offences is proving beyond reasonable doubt who sent an abusive or threatening communication. The petition suggests that it would be easier to enforce these offences if, if it is set out in law that the owner of a mobile phone is responsible for any communication sent using that device. Responses received highlighted a number of practical difficulties with this approach, which are outlined in our meeting papers. The committee also asked the Scottish Government what action it was taking to review the operation of corroboration in hate crime. The Government is currently in the process of commissioning um, jury research and that any future consideration of corroboration reform would need to await the findings of this research. The Government has also commissioned an independent review of laws covering hate crime offences in Scotland to ensure those laws are fit for purpose. These recommendations are expected to be considered by the Scottish Government in early 2018. Um, and I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for further action. I think it should Lona? be deferred until the review of Lord Brackadale's review of hate crime is concluded. Um, I, I'd, I'd see no merit in doing anything until that, that comes through, because mm. it, it, will, you know, it will be implicated. Yeah, Angus? Yeah, I would agree with uh, Rona Mackay, but um, I wonder if it's possible to make a further attempt to get the petitioner's views on, on the responses that we've received to date from Scottish Government, Police Scotland, uh, Scottish Women's Aid, Respect and Victim Support Scotland. Yeah, I think that would that would be worthwhile. I think that we just we do have this concern. <laughs> I certainly would have the concern, um, since I'm able to lose my phone on a fairly regular basis, that the idea that you would then be responsible. But I, mean, I understand the point of it. I think there's quite an interesting yeah. um, message there about uh, liability and so on, but that I think there is a challenge. But if we're agreeing to defer, but also asking if the petitioner has... Um, uh, comments to make on the response we've had so far. Okay, now we just have to decide whether we can... Right. Um, the last petition we have is this question of the major redesign of healthcare. We do have Rhoda Grant and Kate Forbes here. However, we only have four minutes. And my sense would be that this is an issue that's a bit more serious than that. We want to make sure that it was perhaps given a wee bit more time. I'm in the hands of the committee, to be honest, and and the uh, other MSPs. Time is ticking off, and yes. we decide whether we've got time or not. <laughs> right, I'll make a I'll make a, a judgment. We will defer this consideration of this um, petition to our next meeting. I think you know, there are some petitions you could probably get through. Just, and I wouldn't want the petitioners themselves to think that we hadn't given it due consideration. So, um, if that is agreed. Um, I want to thank everybody for their attendance. We've got through a mighty amount of work today and some very useful petitions. Thank people for their attendance and I'll close the meeting.